Section 1 of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamere. Prelude. Lo, praise of the prowess of people kings, of spear armed Danes in days long sped. We have heard and what honor the athelings won, oft shilled the shaving from squandered foes. From many a tribe the mead bench tore, awing the earls. Since erst he lay friendless and foundling, fate repaid him, for he waxed under welkin, and wealth he throve. Till before him the folk, both far and near, who housed by the whale path heard his mandate, gave him gifts, a good king he. To him an heir was afterward born, a son in the halls whom heaven sent to favor the folk feeling their woe, that erst they had lacked an earl for leader so long a while. The Lord endowed him, the wielder of wonder, with worlds renowned. Famed was this Beowulf, far flew the boast of him, son of Schild and the Scandian lands. So becomes it a youth to quit him well with his father's friends by fee and gift, that to aid him, aged and after days, come warriors willing, should war draw nigh, liegemen loyal by lauded deeds, shall an earl have honor in every clan. Forth he fared at the fated moment, sturdy shield to the shelter of God. Then they bore him over to ocean's billow, loving clansmen, as late he charged them, while wielded words the winsome shield. The leader beloved who long had ruled, in the rockstead rocked a ring-dight vessel, ice-flecked, outbound, atheling's barge. There laid they down, their darling lord, on the breast of the boat, the breaker of rings, by the mast the mighty one. Many a treasure fetched from far was freighted with him. No ship have I known so nobly dight, with weapons of war and weeds of battle, with breastplate and blade, on his bosom lay a heaped hoard that hence should go far o'er the flood, with him floating away. No less these loaded the lordly gifts, thanes huge treasure, than those had done, who in former time forth had sent him, soul on the seas, a suckling child. High o'er his head they hoisted the standard, a gold-wove banner, let billows take him, gave him to ocean. Grave were their spirits, mournful their mood, no man is able to say in sooth, no son of the halls, no hero neath heaven, who harbored that freight. 1. Now Beowulf bowed in the burge of the Schildings, leader beloved, and long he ruled in fame with all folk, since his father had gone away from the world till awoke an heir, haughty Halif de Na, who held through life, sage and sturdy, the Schildings glad. Then one after one there woke to him the chieftain of clansmen, children four, Haragar, then Hrothgar, then Halga Brave, and I heard that Blank was Blank's queen. The Heatho Skilfing's helpmate dear, to Hrothgar was given such glory of war, such honor of combat, that all his kin obeyed him gladly till great grew his band of youthful comrades. It came in his mind to bid his henchmen a hall uprear, a master mead house, mightier far than ever was seen by the sons of earth. And within it, then, too, old and young, he would all allot that the Lord had sent him, save only the land and the lives of his men. Wide, I heard, was the work commanded, for many a tribe this mid-earth round to fashion the folkstead. It fell as he ordered, in rapid achievement, that ready it stood there of halls the noblest. Hey, O oh, Rot, he named it, whose message had might in many a land, not reckless of promise, the rings he dealt treasure at banquet. There towered the hall, high, gabled wide, the hot surge waiting of furious flame. Not far was the day when father and son-in-law stood in feud for warfare and hatred that woke again. With envy and anger, an evil spirit endured the dull in his dark abode, that he heard each day the din of revel, high in the hall, 
There, harps rang out, clear song of the singer. He sang who knew tales of the early time of man, how the Almighty made the earth, fairest fields enfolded by water, set, triumphant, sun and moon, for a light to lighten the land-dwellers, and braided bright the breast of earth, with limbs and leaves, made life for all of mortal beings that breathe and move. So lived the clansmen in cheer and revel, a winsome life, till one began to fashion evils, that field of hell. Grendel, this monster grim was called, March Raver mighty, in moorland living, in fen and fastness, fief of the giants, the hapless wit a while had kept since the creature his exile doomed. On kin of Cain was the killing avenged by sovereign God for slaughtered Abel. Ill fared his feud, and far was he driven for the slaughter's sake from sight of men. Of Cain awoke all that woeful breed, Ettons and elves and evil spirits, as well as the giants that warred with God weary while, but their wage was paid them. 2. Went he forth to find, at fall of night, that haughty house, and heed wherever. The ring Danes, out reveled, to rest had gone, found within it the atheling band, asleep after feasting and fearless of sorrow, of human hardship. Unhallowed wit, grim and greedy, he grasped betimes, wrathful, reckless, from resting places. Thirty of the thanes, and thence he rushed, fain of his fell spoil, faring homeward, laden with slaughter, his lair to seek. Then at the dawning, as day was breaking, the might of Grendel to men was known. Then after was sail, was wail uplifted, loud moan in the morn. The mighty chief, atheling excellent, unblithe sat, labored in woe for the loss of his thanes. When once he had traced the trail of the fiend, spirit accursed, too cruel that sorrow, too long, too loathsome, not late the respite. With night returning, a new began ruthless murder. He wrecked no wit, firm in his guilt. Of the feud and crime, they were easy to find who elsewhere sought in room remote, their rest at night. Bed in the bowers, when that bale was shown, was seen in sooth, with surest token, the hall thanes hate. Such held themselves far and fast, who the fiend outran. Thus ruled unrighteous, and raged his fill, one against all, until empty stood that lordly building, and long it bode so. Twelve years tied the trouble he bore, sovereign of shieldings, sorrows and plenty, boundless cares. There came unhidden tidings true to the tribes of men in sorrowful songs. How ceaselessly Grendel harassed Hrothgar, what hate he bore him, what murder and massacre many a year, feud unfading, Blank refused consent to deal with any of Daneland's earls, make pact of peace or compound of gold. Still less did the wise men ween to get great fee for the feud from his fiendish hands. But the evil one ambushed old and young, death shadow dark, and dogged them still, lured or lurked in the live-long night. Of misty moorlands men may say not where the haunts of these hell runes be. Such heaping of horrors the hater of men, lonely roamer, wrought unceasing, harassings heavy, or hey o wrought he lorded, gold, bright hall, and gloomy nights, and ne'er could the prince approach his throne, t'was judgment of God, or have joy in his hall. Sore was the sorrow to Shilding's friend, heart-rending misery. Many nobles sat assembled and searched out counsel, how it were best for bold-hearted men against harassing terror to try their hand. Whiles they vowed in their heathen fanes altar offerings, ask with words that the slayer of souls would secure give them for the pain of their people. There practiced this, their heathen hope. T'was hell they thought of in mood of their mind. Almighty they knew not, doomsmen of deeds and dreadful lord, nor heaven's helmet heeded they ever, wielder of wonder. Woe for that man who in harm and hatred hails his soul to fiery embraces, nor favor nor change awaits he ever, but well for him that after death day may draw to his Lord and friendship find in the Father's arms. End of section 1. Recording by Tad E.
Section 2 of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamere. 3. Thus seething unceasing the son of Halef Dena, with the woe of these days, not wisest men assuaged his sorrow too sore the anguish, loathly and long that lay on his folk, most baneful and burdens and bales of the night. This herd in his home he Yalak's thane, great among Gaiats of Grendel's doings. He was the mightiest man of valor in that same day of this our life, stalwart and stately. A stout wave-walker he bade make ready. Yon battle-king, said he, far o'er the swan-road, he fain would seek. The noble monarch who needed men, the prince's journey by prudent folk was little blamed, though they loved him dear. They wedded the hero and hailed good omens. And now the bold one from bands of Gaiats, comrades chose the keenest of warriors, ere he could find, with fourteen men, the sea wood he sought, and sailor proved, led them on the land's confines. Time had now flown, afloat was the ship boat under bluff. On board they climbed warriors ready, waves were churning sea with sand, the sailors bore on the breast of the bark their bright array, their mail and weapons. The men pushed off on its willing way the well-braced craft, then moved o'er the waters by might of the wind, that bark like a bird with breast of foam, till in season due, on the second day, the curved prow such course had run, that sailors now could see the land, sea cliffs shining, steep high hills, headlands broad. Their haven was found, their journey ended. Up then quickly the weeders, clansmen climbed ashore, anchored their sea wood with armor clashing and gear of battle. God they thanked on passing in peace o'er the pass of the sea. Now saw from the cliff a shielding clansman, a warden that watched the water's side, how they bore o'er the gangway glittering shields, war gear and readiness. Wonder seized him to know what manner of men they were. Straight to the strand his steed he rode. Hrothgar's henchman, with hand of might, he shook his spear and spake in parley. Who are ye then, ye armed men, mailed folk that yon mighty vessel have urged thus over the ocean ways, here o'er the waters? A warden eye, sentinel set over the sea march here, lest any foe to the folk of Danes with harrying fleet should harm the land. No aliens ever at ease thus bore them. Linden wielders, yet word of leave, clearly ye lack from clansmen here, my folk's agreement. A greater ne'er saw I of warriors in world than is one of you, yon hero in harness. No henchman he worthied my weapons, if witness his features, his peerless presence. I pray you, though, tell your folk in home, lest hence ye fare suspect to wander your way as spies in Danish land. Now, dwellers afar, ocean travelers, take from me simple advice. The sooner the better. I hear of the country whence ye came. 4. To him the stateliest spake in answer, the warrior's leader, his word hoard unlocked. We are by kin of the clan of Gaiats, and he ye locks own hearth fellows we. To folk afar my father known, noble atheling, Edge Theo named. Full of winters, he fared away, aged from earth. He is honored still, through width of the world, by wise men all. To thy lord and liege in loyal mood, we hasten hither. To Halafdena's son, people protector, be pleased to advise us. To that almighty one come we on mickle errand. To the lord of the Danes, nor deem I right, that ought be hidden. We here thou knowest, if sooth is the saying of men, that amid the shieldings a scathing monster, dark ill-doer, in dusky nights, shows terrific his rage unmatched, hatred and murder. 
to Hrothgar in greatness of soul would succor bring, to the wise and brave may worst his foes, if ever the end of ills is fated, of cruelest contest, if cure shall follow, and the boiling care waves cooler grow, else ever afterward anguish days. He shall suffer in sorrow while stands in place high on its hill that house unpeered. Astride his steed, the strandward answered, clansman unquailed, The keen-souled thane must be skilled to sever and sunder duly words and works, if he well intends. I gather this band is graciously bent to the shielding's master. March, then, bearing weapons and weeds that way I show you. I will bid my men, your boat, meanwhile, to guard for fear lest foemen come, your new tarred ship, by shore of ocean, faithfully watching till once again it waft o'er the waters those well-loved thanes. Winding-necked wood to wetter's bounds, heroes such as the hest of fate shall succor and save from the shockek of war. They bent them to march, the boat lay still, fettered by cable and fast at anchor, broad-bosomed ship, then shone the boars over the cheek-guard, chased with gold, keen and gleaming, guard it kept, or the man of water, as marched along heroes in haste, till the hall they saw, broad of gable and bright with gold. That was the fairest, mid-folk of earth, of houses neath heaven, where Hrothgar lived, and the gleam of it lightened o'er lands afar. The sturdy shieldsmen showed that bright burge of the boldest, bade them go straightway thither. His steed then turned, hardy hero, and hailed them thus. "'Tis time that I fare from you, Father Almighty, in grace and mercy guard you well, save in your seekings. Seaward I go, gainst hostile warriors hold my watch. 5. Stone bright the street, it showed the way, to the crowd of clansmen. Corselets glistened, hand forged, hard, on their harness bright, the steel ring sang as they strode along in mail of battle and marched to the hall. There, wary of ocean, the wall along they set their bucklers, their broad shields down and bowed them to bench. The breastplates clanged, war gear of men, their weapons stacked, spears of the seafarer stood together, gray-tipped ash, that iron band was worthily weaponed. A warrior proud asked of the heroes their home and kin, Whence now bear ye burnished shields, harness gray and helmets grim, spears in multitude? Messenger I, Hrothgard's herald, heroes so many, ne'er met I as strangers of mood so strong. Tis plain that prowess not plunged into exile for high-hearted valor. Hrothgar ye see. Him the sturdy in war bespake with words, proud earl of the wetters answer made, hardy neath helmet. He a locks, we fellows at board, I am Beowulf named. I am seeking to say to the son of Halaf de Nur, the mission of mine to thy master lord, the doughty prince, if he deign at all grace that we greet him, the good one now. Wolfgar spake, the Wendell's chieftain, whose might of mind to many was known, his courage and counsel. The king of Danes, the Shilding's friend, I fain will tell, the breaker of rings, as the boon thou askest, the famed prince of thy faring hither, and swiftly after such answer bring as the doughty monarch may deign to give. Hide then in haste to where Hrothgar sat, white-haired and old, his earls about him, till the stout thane stood at the shoulder there of the Danish king. Good courtier he! Wolfgar spake to his winsome lord, Hither! have fared to thee far come men, o'er the plains of ocean, people of Gaiathland, and the stateliest there by his sturdy band is Beowulf named. This boon they seek, that they, my master, may with thee have speech at will, nor spurn their prayer to give them hearing, gracious Hrothgar. In weeds of the warrior worthy, they, methinks, of our liking, their leader most surely a hero that hither his henchman has led. End of section 2 Recording by Tad E. Section 3 of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf 
by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamer. 6. Hrothgar answered, Helmet of Shildings, I knew him of yore in his youthful days. His aged father was Edge Theo named, to whom at home gave Hrethel the Gaiat his only daughter. Their offspring bold fares hither to seek the steadfast friend. And seamen, too, have said me this, who carried my gifts to the Gaiatish court, thither for thanks. He has thirty men heft of grasp in the gripe of his hand, the bold in battle. Blessed God, out of his mercy, this man hath sent to Danes of the West, as I ween indeed against horror of Grendel. I hope to give the good youth gold for his gallant thought. Be thou in haste, and bid them hither, clan of kinsmen, to come before me, and add this word. They are welcome guests to folk of the Danes. To the door of the hall Wolfgar went, and to the word declared, To you this message my master sends, East Danes king, that your kin he knows, hardy heroes, he hails you all. Welcome hither o'er waves of the sea. Ye may wend your way in war attire, and under helmets Hrothgar greet. But let here the battle-shields bide your parley, and wooden war-shafts wait its end. Up rose the mighty one, ringed with his men, brave band of thanes, some bowed without battle-gear guarding, as bade the chief. Then hide that troop, where the herald led them, under Heorot's roof. The hero strode, hardy neath them, till the hearth he neared. Beowulf spake, his breastplate gleamed, war-net woven by wit of the smith. Thou Hrothgar, hail! He locks I, kinsman and follower, fame aplenty have I gained in youth. These Grendel deeds I heard in my homeland heralded clear. Seafarers say, how stands this hall of building best, for your band of thanes empty and idle, when evening sun in the harbor of heaven is hidden away, so my vassals advise me well, brave and wise, the best of men. O sovereign Hrothgar, I seek thee here, for my nerve and my might they knew full well. Themselves had seen me from slaughter come, blood flecked from foes, where five I bound, and that wild brood worsted. I the waves I slew, nickers by night, in need of peril, avenging the wetters, whose woe they sought, crushing the grim ones. Grendel now, monster cruel, be mine to quell in single battle. So from thee, thou sovereign, of the shining Danes, Shildings, bulwark, a boon I seek. And friend of the folk, refuse it not, O warrior shield, now I've wandered far, That I alone with my liegemen here, This hardy band, may Heorot purge. More I hear that the monster dire, In his wanton mood, of weapons, wrecks not. Hence shall I scorn, so Heorot stay, King of my kindred, kind to be, Brand or buckler to bear in the fight, Gold-colored targe, but with gripe alone must I front the fiend and fight for life, foe against foe. Then faith be his in the doom of the Lord whom death shall take. Fain I ween if the fight he win in this hall of gold, my gaiatish band. Will he fearless eat, as oft before, my noblest thanes? Nor needest thou then to hide my head, for his shall I be, died in gore, if death must take me, and my blood-covered body He'll bear as prey, ruthless devour it, the roamer lonely, with my lifeblood redden his lair in the fen. No further for me needst food prepare, to Heulach's send, if Hild shouldst take me, best of war-weeds, warding my breast, armor excellent, heirloom of Hrethel, and work of Wayland, fares word as she must. 7. Hrothgar spake, the Shilding's helmet, for fight defensive, friend my Beowulf, to secure and save thou hast sought us here, thy father's combat a feud enkindled, when Heathalof with hand he slew, among the Wilfings, his wender kin, for horror of fighting fear to hold him. Fleeing he sought our South Dane folk, over surge of ocean, the honor shieldings, when first I was ruling the folk of Danes, wielded, youthful, this widespread realm, this horde hold of heroes. Herogar was dead. My elder brother had breathed his last. Halafdeneu's bairn, he was better than I. Straightway the feud with fee I settled. To the wilfing scent, o'er watery ridges, 
treasures olden, oaths he swore me. Sore is my soul to say to any of the race of man that ruth for me in hail wrought, Grendel with hate hath wrought. What sudden herrings, hall folk fail me, my warriors wane, for word hath swept them into Grendel's grasp. But God is able this deadly foe from his deeds to turn. Boasted full oft, as my beer they drank, earls o'er the ale cup armed men, that they would bide in the beer hall here, Grendel's attack with terror of blades. Then was this mead house at morning tide dyed with gore when the daylight broke, all the boards of the benches blood besprinkled, gory the hall. I had heroes the less, doughty dear ones that death had reft. But sit to the banquet, unbind thy words, hearty hero, as heart shall prompt thee. Gathered together, the gaitish men in the banquet hall on bench assigned, sturdy spirited, sat them down, hearty hearted. A henchman attended, carried the carven cup in hand, served the clear mead. Oft minstrels sang blithe in Heorot. Heroes reveled, no dearth of warriors, Wender and Dane. 8. Unferth spake the son of Ekglaf, who sat at the feet of the Shilding's lord, unbound the battle runes, Beowulf's quest. Sturdy seafarers sorely galled him. Ever he envied that other men should more achieve in middle earth of fame under heaven than he himself. Art thou that Beowulf, Breca's rival, who emulous swam on the open sea, when for pride the pair of you proved the floods, and wantonly dared in waters deep to risk your lives? No living man, or leaf, or loathe, from your labor dire, could you dissuade from swimming the main. Ocean tides with your arms ye covered, with strenuous hands the sea streets measured. Swam o'er the waters, winter storm, rolled the rough waves in the realm of sea. A sennight strove ye, and swimming waters topped thee. Had more of main, him at morning tide. Billows bore to the battling Ramos, whence he hide to his home so dear, beloved of his liegemen, to land of Brondings, fastness fair, when his folk he ruled, town and treasure, and triumph o'er thee. Bayon stands bare, his boast achieved, so ween I thee a worse adventure, though in buffet of battle thou brave hast been, and struggle grim, if Grendel's approach thou darest wait through the watch of night. Beowulf spake, bairn of Edge Theo, What a deal hast uttered, dear my unferth, Drunken with beard, of Breca now, Told him of his triumph, Truth I claim it, That I had more of might in the sea Than any man else, more ocean endurance. We twain had talked in time of youth And made our boast. We were mere boys, stripling still, To stake our lives, far at sea, And so we performed it, Naked swords, as we swam along, we held in hand, with hope to guard us, against the whales, not a whit from me could he float afar o'er the flood of waves, haste o'er the billows, nor him I abandoned. Together we twain on the tides abode, five nights full till the flood divided us, churning waves and chillest weather, darkling night and the northern wind, ruthless rushed on us, rough was the surge. Now the wrath of the sea-fish rose apace, yet me against the monsters my mailed coat, hard and hand-linked, help afforded, battle sark braided my breast to ward, garnished with gold. There grasped me firm and hailed me to bottom, the hated foe, with grimmest gripe. T'was granted me, though to pierce the monster with point of sword, with blade of battle, huge beast of the sea was whelmed by the hurly through hand of mine. End of section two. Section four of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamere. Nine. Me, thus often, the evil monsters thronging threatened, with thrust of my sword, the darling, I dealt them due return. 
No wise had they bliss from their booty then to devour their victim, vengeful creatures, seated to banquet at bottom of sea, but at break of day, by the brand-sore hurt, on the edge of ocean up they lay, put to sleep by the sword, and since by them on the fathomless sea ways sailor folk are never molested. Light from east came bright God's beacon, the billows sank, so that I saw the sea cliffs high windy walls, for word oft saveth Earl undoomed if he doughty be. And so it came that I killed with my sword nine of the knickers, of night-fought battles, ne'er heard I a harder neath heaven's dome, nor adrift on the deep a more desolate man. Yet I came unharmed from that hostile clutch, though spent with swimming, the sea upbore me, flood of the tide of Finnish land, the welling waters. No wise of thee have I heard men tell such terror of falchions, bitter battle. Brecca ne'er yet, not one of you pair, in the play of war such daring deed has done it all with bloody brand, I boast not of it. Though thou wast the bane of thy brethren dear, thy closest kin whence curse of hell awaits thee, well as thy wit may serve. For I say in sooth, thou son of Ekglaf, never had Grendel these grim deeds wrought, monster dire, on thy master dear, and Heo wrought such havoc, if heart of thine were as battle bold as thy boast is loud. But he has found no feud will happen, from sword clash dread of your Danish clan, he vaunts him safe from the victor shieldings, he forces pledges, favors none of the land of Danes, but lustily murders, fights and feasts, nor feud he dreads from spear Dane men, but speedily now shall I prove him prowess and pride of the Gaiots, shall bid him battle. Blithe to mead, go he that listeneth when light of dawn, this morrow morning o'er men of ether robed sun from the south shall beam. Joyous then was the jewel giver, hoar haired, war brave, help awaited, the bright Dane's prince from Beowulf hearing. Folk's good shepherd, such firm resolve, then was laughter of liegemen, loud resounding with winsome words, came Walsh Theo forth, queen of Hrothgar, heedful of courtesy, gold-decked, greeting the guests in hall. And the high-born lady handed the cup, first to the East Danes, heir and warden, bade him be blithe at the beer carouse the land's beloved one. Lustily took he banquet and beaker, battle-famed king. Through the hall then went the helming's lady, to younger and older everywhere carried the cup, till come the moment when the ring-graced queen, the royal-hearted, to Beowulf bore the beaker of mead. She greeted the Gaiot's lord, God, she thanked, in wisdom words, that her will was granted, that at last on a hero her hope could lean, for comfort and terrors. The cup he took, hardy in war, from Walsh Theo's hand, an answer uttered the eager for combat. Beowulf spake, bairn of edge Theo. This was my thought, when my thanes and I bent to the ocean and entered our boat, that I would work the will of your people fully, or fighting fall in death, and fiends gripe fast. I am firm to do an earl's brave deed, or end the days of this life of mine in the mead hall here. Well, these words to the woman seemed Beowulf's battle boast. Bright with gold, the stately dame by her spouse sat down, Again, as erst began in hall, warriors with sail and words of power, the proud bands revel, till presently the son of Helaf de Nye hastened to seek rest for the night. He knew there waited fight for the fiend in that festal hall, when the sheen of the sun they saw no more, and dusk of night sank darkling nigh, and shadowy shapes came striding on, wan under welkin. The warriors rose, man to man he made harangue, Hrothgar to Beowulf, bade him hail, let him wield the wine-hall, a word he added, Never to any man erst I trusted, since I could heave up hand and shield this noble Dane hall till now to thee. Have now and hold this house unpeered, remember thy glory, thy might declare, watch for the foe, no wish shall fail thee, if thou bidest the battle with bold won life. 10. Then Hrothgar went with his hero train, defense of shieldings forth from hall, fain would the warlord Walsh Theo seek, 
couch of his queen, the king of glory, against this Grendel a guard had set. So heroes heard a hall defender, who warded the monarch and watched for the monster. In truth, the Gaiot's prince gladly trusted his mettle, his might, the mercy of God. Cast off then his corselet of iron helmet from head, to his henchmen gave, choicest of weapons, the well-chased sword, bidding him guard the gear of battle. Spake then his vaunt the valiant man, Beowulf Gaiot, ere the bed he sought, of force in fight no feebler I count me, in grim war deeds than Grendel deems him. Not with the sword, then, to sleep of death, his life will I give, though it lie in my power. No skill is his to strike against me, my shield to hew, though he hardy be, bold in battle, we both this night shall spurn the sword. If he seek me here, unweaponed for war, like wisest God, sacred Lord, on which side soever doom decree, as he deemeth right. Reclined then the chieftain, and cheek pillows held the head of the earl, while all about him seamen hardy on hall beds sank. None of them thought that thence their steps to the falcon fastness that fostered them to the land they loved would lead them back. Full well they wist that on warriors many battle death seized in the banquet hall of Danish clan, but comfort and help war wheel weaving to wetter folk the master gave that by might of one over their enemy all prevailed by single strength in sooth tis told that highest god or humankind hath wielded ever through one night striding came the walker and shadow warriors slept whose hess was to guard the gabled hall all save one twas widely known that against god's will the ghostly ravager him could not hurl to haunts of darkness Wakeful, ready, with warrior's wrath, bold, he bided the battle's issue. 11. Then the moorland, by misty crags, with God's wrath laden, Grendel came. The monster was minded of mankind now, sundry to seize in the stately house. Under Welkin he walked, till the wine place there, gold hall of men, he gladly discerned, flashing with fretwork. Not first time this, that he the home of Hrothgar sought, Yet ne'er in his life-day, late or early, such hardy heroes, such hall-thanes found. To the house the warrior walked apace, parted from peace, the portal opened, though with forge bolts fast, when his fists had struck it, and baleful he burst in his blatant rage the house's mouth. All hastily then, o'er fair-proved floor, the fiend trod on, ireful he strode, there streamed from his eyes fearful flashes like flame to see. He spied in hall the hero band, kin and clansmen clustered asleep, hardy liegemen. Then laughed his heart, for the monster was minded, ere morn should dawn, savage, to sever the soul of each, life from body, since lusty banquet waited his will. But word forbade him to seize any more of men of earth after that evening. Eagerly watched he a lock's kinsman, his cursed foe, how he would fare in fell attack, now that the monster was minded to pause, straightway he seized a sleeping warrior for the first and tore him fiercely asunder. The bone frame bit, drank blood in streams, swallowed him piecemeal. Swiftly thus, the lifeless course was clear devoured, eating feet and hands. Then farther he hied, for the hardy hero with hand he grasped, felt for the foe with fiendish claw. For the hero reclining, who clutched it boldly, prompt to answer, propped on his arm. Soon they saw that shepherd of evils that never he met in this middle world in the ways of earth another wit with heavier hand-gripe at heart he feared, sorrowed in soul. None the sooner escaped. Fain would he flee, his fastness seek, the den of devils. No doings now such as oft he had done in days of old. Then bethought him the hardy he thane of his boast at evening. Up he bounded, grass firm his foe, whose fingers cracked. The fiend made off, but the earl close followed. The monster meant, if he might at all, to fling himself free, and far away fly to the fens, knew his fingers' power in the gripe of the grim one. Gruesome march to Hayerot this monster of harm had made. Din filled the room, the Danes were bereft, 
castle dwellers and clansmen all earls of their ale. Angry were both those savage hall guards, the house resounded. Wonder it was the wine hall firm in the strain of their struggle stood. To earth the fair house fell not, too fast it was within and without by its iron bands craftily clamped. Though there crashed from sill, many a mead bench men have told me, gay with gold, where the grim foes wrestled. So well had weaned this wisest shielding that not ever at all might any man that bone-decked brave house break asunder, crush by craft, unless clasp of fire and smoke engulfed it. Again uprose, den redoubled. Danes of the north with fear and frenzy were filled, each one, who from the wall that wailing heard, God's foe sounding his grisly song, cry of the conquered, clamorous pain from captive of hell. Too closely held him, he who of men and might was strongest in that same day of this our life. End of section 4《Section 4》《Section 5 of Beowulf》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown Translated by Francis Barton Gamer. 12. Not in any wise would that earl's defense suffer that slaughterous stranger to live, useless deemed as days and years to men on earth. Now many an earl of Beowulf brandished blade ancestral, fain the life of their lord to shield their praised prince, if power were theirs. Never they knew, as they neared the foe, hardy-hearted hero of war, aiming their swords on every side the accursed to kill. No keenest blade, no fairest of falchions fashioned on earth, could harm or hurt that hideous fiend. He was safe by his spills from sword of battle, from edge of iron, yet his end and parting on that same day of this our life, woeful should be, and his wandering soul far off flit to the fiend's domain. Soon he found, who in former days harmful in heart and hated of God, on many a man such murder wrought, that the frame of his body failed him now. For him the keen-souled kinsman of Heolach held in hand, hateful alive was each to other. The outlaw dire took mortal hurt, a mighty wound showed on his shoulder, and sinews cracked, and the bone frame burst. To Beowulf now the glory was given, and Grendel thence, death sick his den, in the dark moor sought, noisome abode. He knew too well that here was the last of life, an end of his days on earth. To all the Danes, by that bloody battle, the boon had come. From ravage had rescued the roving stranger Hrothgar's hall. The hardy and wise one had purged it anew. His night work pleased him, his deed and its honor. To eastern Danes had the valiant Gaiot his vaunts made good. All their sorrow and ills assuaged, their bale of battle borne so long, and all the dole that erst endured, pain aplenty. T'was proof of this, when the hardy in fight, a hand laid down, arm and shoulder, all indeed of Grendel's gripe, neath the gabled roof. 13. Many at morning, as men have told me, warriors gathered the gift hall round, folk leaders faring from far and near, o'er wide-stretched waves, the wonder to view trace of the traitor. Not troublous seemed the enemy's end to any man, who saw by the gate of the gracious foe how the weary-hearted away from thence baffled and battled and banned, his steps death-marched, dragged to the devil's mere. Bloody the billows were boiling there, turbid the tide of tumbling waves, horribly seething with sword blood hot, by that doomed one died, who in den of the moor laid forlorn his life adown. His heathen soul and hell received it, Home then rode the hoary clansmen from that merry journey, and many a youth on horse white, the hardy warriors, back from the mere. Then Beowulf's glory eager and echoed, and all averred that from sea to sea, or south or north, there was no other in earth's domain under vault of heaven more valiant found of warriors, none more worthy to rule. On their lord beloved they laid no sight, 
Gracious Hrothgar, a good king he, from time to time the tried in battle, their gray steeds set to gallop amain, and ran a race when the road seemed fair, from time to time a thane of the king who had made many vaunts, and was mindful of verses, stored with sages and songs of old, bounded word to word in well-knit rhyme, welded his lay. This warrior soon of Beowulf's quest right cleverly sang, and artfully added an excellent tale, in well-ranged words, of warlike deeds he had heard in saga of Sigmund. Strange the story, he said it all, the whale sings wanderings wide, his struggles, which never were told to tribes of men, the feuds and the frauds, save to Fatella only, when of these doings he deigned to speak, uncle to nephew, as ever the twain stood side by side in stress of war, and multitude of the monster kind they had felled with their swords. Of Sigmund grew, when he passed from life, no little praise, for the doughty in combat a dragon killed, that herded the horde under hoary rock, the atheling dared the deed alone, fearful quest, nor was Fatella there. Yet so it befell his falchion pierced that wondrous worm, on the wall it struck best blade, the dragon died in its blood. Thus had the dread one by daring achieved over the ring horde to rule at will, himself to pleasure. A sea-boat he loaded and bore on its bosom the beaming gold, son of Wales. The worm was consumed. He had of all heroes the highest renown among races of men, this refuge of warriors for deeds of daring that decked his name since the hand and heart of Hayamode grew slack in battle. He swiftly banished to mingle with monsters and mercy of foes, to death was betrayed, for torrents of sorrow had lamed him too long. A load of care to earls and athelings all he proved, oft indeed in earlier days, for the warrior's wayfaring wise men mourned, who had hoped of him help from harm and bale, and had thought their sovereign son would thrive, follow his father, his folk protect, the horde and the stronghold, hero's land, home of shildings. But there, Thane said, the kinsman of Heloch, Kinder, seemed to all, the other was urged to crime. Afresh to the race, the fallow roads by swift steeds measured. The morning sun was climbing higher. Clansmen hastened to the high-built hall, those hardy-minded. The wonder to witness, warden of treasure crowned with glory, the king himself with stately band from the bride-bower strode, and with him the queen and her crowd of maidens measured the path to the mead-house fair. 14. Hrothgar spake. To the hall he went stood by steps the steep roof saw garnished with gold and grendel's hand for the sight i see to the sovereign ruler be speedy thanks a throng of sorrows i have borne from grendel but god still works wonder on wonder the warden of glory it was but now that i never more for woes that weighed on me waited help long as i lived when laved in blood stood sword gore stained the stateliest house Widespread woe for wise men all, who had no hope to hinder ever foes infernal and fiendish sprites from havoc and hall. This hero now, by the wielder's might, a work has done that not all of us erst could e'er do by wile and wisdom. Lo, well can she say, whoso of woman this warrior bore, among sons of men, if still she liveth, that God of the ages was good to her in the birth of her bairn. Now, Beowulf, thee, of heroes best, I shall heartily love as my own, my son. Preserveth thou ever this kinship new, thou shalt never lack wealth of the world that I wield as mine. Full off for less have I largest showered my precious hoard on a punier man, less stout in struggle. Thyself hast now fulfilled such deeds that thy fame shall endure through all the ages, as ever did well may the wielder reward thee still." Beowulf spake, Baron of Theo. This work of war most willingly we have fought, this fight and fearlessly dared force of the foe. Fain too were I. Hadst thou but seen himself, what time the fiend in his trappings trotted to fall? Swiftly I thought, and strongest gripe, on the bed of death to bind him down, that he in the tent of this hand of mine should breathe his last. But he broke away. Him I might not, the maker willed, hinder from flight, and firm enough hold the life-destroyer. Too sturdy was he, the ruthless and running. 
For rescue, however, he left behind him his hand in pledge, arm and shoulder, nor aught of help could the cursed one thus procure at all. None the longer liveth he, loathsome fiend, sunk in his sins, but sorrows hold him tightly grasped in gripe of anguish, in baleful bonds where bide he must, evil outlaw, such awful doom as the mighty maker shall meet him out. More silent seemed the son of Ecglaf, in boastful speech of his battle deeds, since Atheling's awe, through the earl's great prowess, beheld that hand on the high roof gazing, foeman's finger, the forepart of each of the sturdy nails to steel was likest, heathen's hand spear, hostile warrior's claw uncanny. Twas clear, they said, that to him no blade of the brave could touch, how keen soever or cut away that battle hand bloody from baleful foe. End of section 5《Section 6 of Beowulf》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. — Beowulf — by Unknown Translated by Francis Barton Gamere 15. There was hurry and hest and hayo rot now, for hands to bedeck it, and dense was the throng of men and women, the wine-hall to cleanse, the guest-room to garnish, Gold ray shone the hangings, there were wove on the wall, and wonders many to delight each mortal that looks upon them, though braced within by iron clads. That building bright was broken sorely, rent were its hinges, the roof alone held safe and sound, when seared with crime the fiendish foe, his flight essayed, of life despairing. No light thing that, the flight for safety, essay it who will. Forced of fate, he shall find his way to the refuge ready for race of man, for sole possessors and sons of earth, and there his body on bed of death shall rest after revel. Arrived was the hour when to hall proceed Halafdeinu's son, the king himself would sit to banquet. Ne'er heard I of host and haughtier throng, more graciously gathered round, giver of rings, Bowed then to bench those bearers of glory, fain of the feasting, featly received many a mead cup, the mighty in spirit, kinsmen who sat in the sumptuous hall, Hrothgar and Hrothulf. Heorot now was filled with friends, the folk of Schildings, ne'er yet had tried the traitor's deed, to Beowulf gave the bairn of Halef de Nu a gold-wove banner, guerdon of triumph, broidered battle-flag, breastplate and helmet, and a splendid sword was seen of many born to the brave one. Beowulf took cup and hall, for such costly gifts he suffered no shame in that soldier throng, for I heard of few heroes in hardier mood, with four such gifts so fashioned with gold, on the ale-bunch honoring others thus. O'er the roof of the helmet high, a ridge wound with wires, kept ward o'er the head, lest the relict of flies should fierce invade, sharp in the strife, when that shielded hero should go to grapple against his foes. Then the earl's defense on the floor bade lead coursers eight, with carven headgear adown the hall. One horse was decked with a saddle all shining and set in jewels. T'was the battle-seat of the best kings, when to play of swords the son of Halaf de Nu was fain to fare. Never failed his valor in the crush of combat when corpses fell, to Beowulf over them both then gave the refuge of Ingwine's right and power. O'er water steeds and weapons wished him joy of them. Men fully thus the mighty prince, hoard guard for heroes, that hard fight repaid with steeds and treasures, contemned by none who is willing to say the sooth all right. 16. And the lord of earls to each that came with Beowulf, over the briny ways, an heirloom there at the ale-bench gave, precious gift, and the price bade pay in gold for him whom Grendel erst murdered, blank and fain of them more had killed. Had not wisest God with word averted, and the man's brave mood? The maker then ruled humankind, as here and now. Therefore is insight always best, and forethought of mind. How much awaits him, of leaf and of loaf, who long time here, through days of warfare, this world endures. 
Then song and music mingled sounds in the presence of Halafde Nu's head of armies, and harping was heard with the hero lay, as Hrothgar's singer the hall joy woke along the mead seats, making his son of that sudden raid on the sons of Finn. Halafde Nu's hero, Hnaf the shielding, was fated to fall in the Frisian slaughter. Hilda Birch needed not hold in value her enemy's honor. Innocent both were the loved ones she lost at the linden play. Bairn and brother, they bowed to fate, stricken by spears. T'was a sorrowful woman. None doubted why the daughter of Hoke bewailed her doom when dawning came, and under the sky she saw them dying, kinsmen murdered, where most she had kenned of the sweets of the world. By war were swept too Finn's own liegemen, and few were left in the parley place. He could ply no longer weapon, nor war could he wage on Hengist, and rescue his remnant by right of arms from the prince's thane. A pact he offered, another dwelling the Danes should have, hall and high seat, and half the power should fall to them in Frisian land. And at the fee gifts Folkwald's son, day by day the Danes should honor, the folk of Hengest favor with rings, even as truly with treasure and jewels, with fretted gold, as his Frisian kin, he meant to honor an ale hall there. Pact of peace they plighted further, on both sides firmly. Finn to Hengest with oath upon honor, openly promised that woeful remnant, with wise men's aid, nobly to govern so none of the guests by word or work should warp the treaty, or with malice of mind bemoan themselves as forced to follow their free giver slayer, lordless men as their lot ordained. Should Frisian, moreover, with foeman's taunt that murderous hatred to mind recall, then edge of the sword must seal his doom. Oaths were given, and ancient gold heaped from hoard, then hardy shielding battle thane best on his balefire lay. All on the pyre were plain to see the gory sark, the gilded swine crest, boar of hard iron, and atheling many slain by the sword. At the slaughter they fell. It was Hildebert's hest at Hnaf's own pyre, the bairn of her body on brands to lay, his bones to burn on the baleful place at his uncle's side. In sorrowful dirges bewept them the woman, great wailing ascended. Then, wound up to welkin, the wildest of death-fires roared o'er the hillock, heeds all were melted, gashes burst, and blood gushed out from bites of the body. Baleful devoured, greediest spirit, those spared not by war out of either folk, their flower was gone. 17. Then hastened those heroes, their home to see, friendless to find the Frisian land, houses and high burge. Hengist still, through the death-dyed winter, dwelt with Finn, holding pact, yet of home he minded, though powerless his ring-decked prow to drive over the waters, now waves rolled fierce, lashed by the winds, or winter locked them in icy fetters. Then fared another year to men's dwellings, as yet they do, the sun-bright skies that their season ever dully await. Far off winter was driven, fair lay earth's breast, and fain was the rover, the guest, to depart, though more gladly he pondered on wrecking his vengeance than roaming the deep. And how to hasten the hot encounter where sons of the Frisian were sure to be. So he escaped, not the common doom, when Hun, with laughing, the light of battle, best of blades, his bosom pierced. Its edge was famed with the Frisian earls. On fierce heart, Finn, there fell likewise. On himself at home, the horrid sword, death, for Guthlof and Oslof of grim attack, had sorrowing told, from seaways landed, mourning their foes. Finn's wavering spirit bowed not in breast. The burge was reddened with blood of foemen, and Finn was slain, king amid clansmen. The queen was taken. To the ship the shielding warriors bore all the chattels the chieftain owned, whatever they found in Finn's domain of gems and jewels. The gentle wife, o'er paths of the deep, to the Danes they bore, led to her land. The lay was finished. 
the gleeman's song. Then glad rose the revel, bench joy brightened, bears draw from their wonder vats wine. Comes Walsh Theo forth, under gold crown goes where the good pair sit, uncle and nephew, true each to the other one kindred in amity. Unfirth the spokesman at the shielding's lord feet sat, men had faith in his spirit, his keenness of courage, though kinsmen had found him, unsure at the sword play. The shielding queen spoke, Quaff of this cup, my king and lord, breaker of rings, and blithe be thou, gold friend of men, to the gaiots here speak, such words of mildness as man should use, be glad with thy gaiots, of these gifts be mindful, or near or far, which now thou hast. Men say to me, as son thou wishest yon hero to hold, thy hay-wrought purged jewel-hall brightest, enjoy while thou canst with many a largest, and leave to thy kin, folk, and realm when forth thou goest to greet thy doom. For gracious I deem my Hrothulf, willing to hold and rule nobly our youths, if thou yield up first, prince of shieldings, thy part in the world, I ween with good he will well requite offspring of ours, when all he minds that for him we did in his helpless days of gift and grace to gain him honor. Then she turned to the seat where her sons were placed, Prethic and Hrothmund with heroes' bairns, young men together, the Gaiot too sat there, Beowulf brave, the brothers between. End of section 6「Section 7 of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamer. 18. A cup she gave him with kindred greeting and winsome words, of wound and gold she offered to honor him, arm jewels twain, corslet and rings, and of collars the noblest that ever I knew the earth around. Ne'er heard I so mighty neath heaven's dome a hoard gem of heroes, since Hama bore his bright-built burge, the bristling's necklace, jewel and gem casket. Jealousy fled he, Aomenric's hate, chose help eternal. He like Gaiet, grandson of Swarting, on the last of his raids, this ring bore with him, under his banner, the booty defending, the war spoil warding, but word o'erwhelmed him, what time in his daring dangers he sought, feud with Frisians. Fairest of gems he bore with him, over the beaker of waves, sovereign strong, under shield he died, fell the corpse of the king into keeping of Franks, gear of the breast, and that gorgeous ring, Weaker warriors won the spoil, after gripe of battle from Gaiatland's lord, and held the death-field. Din rose in hall, Walch Theo spake amid warriors, and said, This jewel and joy in thou jocund youth, Beowulf loved these battle-weeds, wear a royal treasure, and richly thrive. Preserve thy strength in these striplings here, counsel and kindress, requital be mine, hast done now deeds that for days to come thou art famed among folk, both far and near, so wide as washest the wave of ocean his windy walls? Through the walls of life prosper, O prince. I pray for thee rich possessions, to son of mine be helpful indeed, and uphold his joys. Here every earl to the other is true, mild of mood to the master loyal. Thanes are friendly, the throng obedient, liegemen are reveling, list and obey went then to her place, that was proudest of feasts, flowed wine for the warriors, word they knew not, destiny dire and the doom to be seen by many an earl, when eve should come and Hrothgar homeward hasten away, royal to rest. The room was guarded by an army of earls, and erst was done. They bared the bench-boards, abroad they spread beds and bolsters, one beer carouser in danger of doom lay down in the hall. At their heads they set shields of war, bucklers bright, on the bench were there over each atheling easy to see, the high battle helmet, the haughty spear, the corselet of rings. 
"'Twas their custom so ever to be for battle prepared at home, or harrying, which it were, even as oft as evil threatened their sovereign king. They were clansmen good. 19. Then sank they to sleep, with sorrow one bought his rest of the evening, as oft time had happened. When Grendel guarded that golden hall, evil wrought till his end drew nigh, slaughter for sins. T'was seen and told how an avenger survived the fiend and was learned afar. The live-long time after that grim fight, Grendel's mother, monster of women, mourned her woe. She was doomed to dwell in the dreary waters, cold sea courses, since Cain cut down with edge of the sword his only brother, his father's offspring, outlawed he fled marked with murder from men's delights warded the wilds there awoke from him such fate sent ghost as grendel who war wolf horrid at heorot found a warrior watching and waiting the fray with whom the grisly one grappled amain but the man remembered his mighty power, the glorious gift that God had sent him, and his maker's mercy put his trust for comfort and help. So he conquered the foe, felled the fiend, who fled abject, reft of joy, to the realms of death mankind's foe. And his mother now, gloomy and grim, would go that quest of sorrow, the death of her son to avenge. To Heorot came she, where helmeted Danes slept in the hall. Too soon came back old ills of the earls when in she burst, the mother of Grendel, less grim, though, that terror, e'en as terror of woman in war is less might of maid than of men in arms when hammer forged the falchion hard, sword gore-stained, through swine of the helm crested with keen blade carves amain. Then was in hall the hard edge drawn, the swords on the settles, and shields of many held firm in hand, nor helmet minded, nor harness of mail, whom that horror seized. Haste was hers, she would high afar and save her life when the liegemen saw her. Yet a single atheling up she seized, fast and firm, and she fled to the moor. He was for Hrothgar of heroes the dearest of trusty vassals betwixt the seas, whom she killed on his couch, a clansman famous, and battle brave. Nor was Beowulf there, another house had been held apart, after giving of gold for the guy at renowned. Uproar filled Heorot, the hand all had viewed, blood flecked, she bore with her, Bale was returned, dole in the dwellings. T'was dire exchange when Dane and Guyot were doomed to give the lives of loved ones. Long-tried king, the hoary hero, at heart was sad when he knew his noble no more lived, and dead indeed was his dearest thane. To his bower was Beowulf brought in haste, dauntless victor. As daylight broke along his earls, the atheling lord with his clansmen came where the king abode, waiting to see if the wielder of all would turn this tale of trouble and woe. Strode o'er flood the famed in strife with his hand companions, the hall resounded, wishing to greet the wise old king, Ingwine's lord. He asked if the night had passed in peace to the prince's mind. 20. Hrothgar spake, helmet of shieldings. Ask not of pleasure, pain is renewed to Danish folk. Dead is Asherah of Jermenlaf, the elder brother, my sage adviser and stay in council, shoulder comrade in stress of fight when warriors clashed and we warded our heads, hewed the helm boars, hero famed, should be every earl as Asherah was. But there in Heorot a hand hath slain him of wandering death sprite. I wot not whither, proud of the prey, her path she took, fain of her fill, the feud she avenged that yesternight unyieldingly. Grendel in grimmest grass thou killedst, seeing how long these liegemen mine he ruined and ravaged. Reft of life in arms he fell. Now another comes keen and cruel, her kin to avenge, 
faring far in feud of blood, so that many a thane shall think, who e'er sorrows in soul for that sharer of rings, is the hardest of heart bales. The hand lies low that once was willing each wish to please. Land dwellers here, and liegemen mine, who house by those parts, I have heard relate that such a pair they have sometimes seen, march stalkers mighty, the moorland haunting, wandering spirits, one of them seemed so far as my folk could fairly judge a womankind, and one accursed in man's guise trot the misery track of exile, though huger than human bulk. Grendel in days long gone they named him, folk of the land, his father they knew not, nor any brood that was born to him of treacherous spirits. Untrod is their home, by wolf cliffs haunt they, and windy headlands, fenways fearful, where flows the stream from mountains gliding to gloom of the rocks, underground flood. Not far is it hence in measure of miles that the mere expands, and o'er it the frost-bound forest hanging sturdily rooted shadows the wave. By night is a wonder weird to see, fire on the waters. So wise lived none of these sons of men to search those depths. Nay, though the heath rover harried by dogs the horn-proud heart, this holt should seek, long distance driven, his dear life first on the brink he yields, ere he brave the plunge to hide his head. Tis no happy place. Thence the welter of waters washes up, wan to welkin when winds bestir evil storms and air grows dusk, and the heavens weep. Now is help once more with thee alone. The land thou knowest not, place of fear, where thou findest out that sin-flecked being, seek if thou dare, I will reward thee for waging this fight, with ancient treasure and erst I did, with winding gold if thou winnest back. End of section 7section 8 of beowulf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by tad e beowulf by unknown translated by francis barton gamer 21 beowulf spake bairn of edge theo sorrow not sage it beseems us better friends to avenge than fruitlessly mourn them each of us all must his end abide in the ways of the world so when who may glory ere death when his days are told that is the warrior's worthiest doom rise o realm warder ride we anon and mark the trail of the mother of grendel no harbor shall hide her heed my promise enfold of field or forestead mountain or floor of the flood let her flee where she will be thou this day endure in patience as i ween thou wilt thy woes each one leaped up the greybeard god he thanked mighty lord for the man's brave words for hrothgar soon a horse was saddled wave-maned steed the sovereign wise stately rode on his shield-armed men followed in force the footprints led along the woodland widely seen a path o'er the plain where she passed and trod the murky moor of men at arms she bore the bravest and best one dead him who with hrothgar the homestead ruled on then went the atheling born, o'er stone cliffs steep and straight defiles, narrow passes and unknown ways, headlands sheer and the haunts of the knickers. Foremost he fared, a few at his side, of the wiser men, the ways to scan, till he found in a flash the forested hill, hanging over the hoary rock, a woeful wood, the waves below, were dyed in blood. The Danish men had sorrow of soul, and for shieldings all, for many a hero t'was hard to bear. Ill for earls, when Asherah's head they found by the flood on the foreland there. Waves were welling, the warriors saw, hot with blood, but the horn sang oft battle-song bold. The band sat down and watched on the water, worm-like things, 
sea dragons strange that sounded the deep, and knickers that lay on the ledge of the nests, such as oft assay at hour of morn on the road of sails their ruthless quest, and sea snakes and monsters, these started away, swollen and savage, that song to hear, that war horn's blast, the warden of Gaiots with bolt from bow, then balked of life, of wave work, one monster amid its heart, went the keen war shaft, and water it seemed, less doughty in swimming, whom death had seized. Swift on the billows, with boar spears well hooked and barbed, it was hard beset, done to death and dragged on the headland, wave roamer wondrous. Warriors viewed the grisly guest, then girt him Beowulf and martial mail, nor mourned for his life, his breastplate broad and bright of hues, woven by hand should the waters try. Well could it ward the warrior's body, that battle should break on his breast in vain, nor harm his heart by hand of a foe. And the helmet white that his head protected was destined to dare the deeps of the flood, through wave whirlwind, t'was wound with chains decked with gold, as in days of yore the weaponsmith worked it wondrously, with swine form set it, that swords no wise, brandished in battle, could bite that helm. Nor was that the meanest of mighty helps, which Hrothgar's orator offered at need. Hunting they named the hilted sword, of old-time heirlooms easily first, iron was its edge and etched with poison, with battle blood hardened, nor blenched it at fight, and hero's hand who held it ever, on paths of peril prepared to go to folkstead of foes. Not first time this, it was destined to do a daring task, for he bore not in mind the bairn of Ekglaf, sturdy and strong, that speech he had made, drunk with wine, now this weapon he lent to a stouter swordsman. Himself, though, durst not under welter of waters wager his life as loyal liegeman. So lost he his glory, honor of earls, with the other not so, who girded him now for the grim encounter. 22. Beowulf spake, Baron of Edgetheo, Have mine, thou offspring, of Heolufna, gold friend of mine, now I go on this quest, sovereign wise, what once was said. If in thy cause it came that I should lose my life, thou wouldst loyal bide to me, though fallen in father's place. Be guardian now to this group of my thanes, my warrior friends, if war should seize me, and the goodly gifts thou gavest me, Hrothgar, beloved, to Heolok send. Gaelot's king may ken by the gold, Hrethel's son see, when he stares at the treasure, that I got me a friend for goodness famed, and joyed while I could in my jewel bestower. And let Unferth wield the wondrous sword, Earl far honored, this heirloom precious, hard of edge, with Hrething I seek doom of glory, or death shall take me. After these words, the wetter Gaiot lord boldly hastened, bidding never answer at all. The ocean floods closed o'er the hero. Long while of the day, long while of the day fled ere he felt the floor of the sea. Soon found the fiend, who the flood domain, sword hungry, held these hundred winters, greedy and grim, that some guest from above, some man, was raiding her monster realm. She grasped out for him with grisly claws, and the warrior seized, yet scathed she not his body hail. The breastplate hindered as she strove to shatter the sark of war, the linked harness with loathsome hand. Then bore this brine wolf, when bottom she touched, the lord of rings to the lair she haunted, while vainly he strove, though his valor held, weapon to wield against wondrous monsters that sore beset him. Sea beasts many tried with fierce tusks to tear his mail and swarm on the stranger, but soon he marched. He was now in some hall he knew not which, where water never could work him harm, nor through the roof could reach him ever fangs of the flood. Firelight he saw, beams of a blaze that brightly shone. Then the warrior was ware of that wolf of the deep, mere wife monstrous. For mighty stroke he swung his blade, and the blow withheld not. Then sang on her head that seemly blade its war-song wild. But the warrior found the light of battle, was loath to bite to harm the heart. Its hard edge failed the noble at need. 
yet had known of old strife hand to hand, and had helmets cloven doomed men's fighting gear. First time this for the gleaming blade that its glory fell. Firm still stood, nor failed in valor, heedful of high deeds, Helok's kinsman flung away fretted sword, featly jeweled the angry earl, on earth it lay, steel-edged and stiff. His strength he trusted, hand-gripe of might, so man shall do whenever in war he weans to earn him lasting fame, nor fears for his life. Seize then by shoulder, shrank not from combat, the guiatus war prince Grendel's mother. Flung then the fierce one, filled with wrath his deadly foe that she fell to ground. Swift on her part she paid him back, with grisly grasp and grappled with him. Spent with struggle, stumbled the warrior, fiercest of fighting men fell adown. On the hall guest she hurled herself, hent her short sword, broad and brown-edged, the bairn to avenge, the soul-born son. On his shoulder lay braided breast-mail, barring death, withstanding entrance of edge or blade. Life would have ended for Edgetheo's son under wide earth, for Earl of Gaiats had his armor of war not aided him. Battle net hard, and holy God wielded the victor, wisest maker. The Lord of heaven allowed his cause, and easily rose the earl erect. 23. Mid the battle gear saw he a blade triumphant, old sword of Edens, with edge of proof, warrior's heirloom, weapon unmatched, save only twas more than other men to bandy of battle could bear at all, as the giants had wrought it, ready and keen. Seize then its chain hilt the shielding's chieftain, bold and battle grim, brandished the sword, reckless of life, and so wrathfully smote, that it gripped her neck and grasped her hard, her bone rings breaking, the blade pierced through that faded one's flesh, to floor she sank, bloody the blade, he was blithe of his deed. Then blazed forth light, t'was bright within, as when from the sky there shines unclouded heaven's candle. The hall he scanned, by the wall then went he, his weapon raised, high by its hilts, the Heloc thane, angry and eager. That edge was not useless to the warrior now. He wished with speed Grendel to guerdon for grim raids many, for the war he waged on western Danes, oftener far than an only time when of Hrothgar's hearth companions he slew in slumber and deep devoured. Fifteen men of the folk of Danes, and as many others, outward bore his horrible prey. Well paid for that, the wrathful prince. For now prone he saw Grendel stretched there, spent with war, spoiled of life, so scathed had left him Heorot's battle. The body sprang far when after death it endured the blow, sword stroke savage, that severed its head. Soon then saw the sage companions who waited with Hrothgar watching the flood that the tossing waters turbid grew. Blood stained the mere, old men together, hoary haired, of the hero spake, the warrior would not. They weaned again, proud of conquest, come to seek their mighty master. To many it seemed the wolf of the waves had won his life. The ninth hour came, the noble shieldings left the headland, homeward went the gold friend of men. But the guests sat on, stared at the surges, sick in heart and wished, yet weaned not their winsome lord again to see. Now that sword began from blood of the fight and battle droppings, war blade to wane, t'was a wondrous thing, that all of it melted as ice is wont. When frosty fetters the father loosens, unwinds the wave bonds, wielding all seasons and times, the true god he, nor took from that dwelling the duke of the Gaiats, save only the head and that hilt withal blazoned with jewels, the blade had melted, burned was the bright sword, her blood was so hot, so poisoned the hell sprite who perished within there. Soon he was swimming, who safe saw in combat, downfall of demons, up dove through the flood. The clashing waters were cleansed now, waste of waves where the wandering fiend her life days left and the lapsing world. 
swam then to strand the sailor's refuge, sturdy in spirit, of sea booty glad, of burden brave he bore with him, went then to greet him, and God they thanked the thane band choice of their chieftain blithe, that safe and sound they could see him again. Soon from the hardy one helmet and honor deftly they doffed. Now drowsed the mere, water neath welkin, the war-blood stained. Forth they fared by the footpaths thence, merry at heart the highways measured, well-known roads. Courageous men carried the head from the cliff by the sea, an arduous task for all the band. The firm and fight since four were needed on the shaft of slaughter, strenuously to bear to the gold hall Grendel's head. So presently to the palace there, foemen fearless, fourteen guyots marching came, their master of clan, mighty amid them, the meadow-ways trod, strode then within the sovereign thane, fearless in fight, of fame renowned, hardy hero Hrothgar to greet. And next by the hare into hall was born Grendel's head, where the henchmen were drinking, an awe to clan and queen alike, a monster of marvel, the men looked on. End of section 8《Section 9 of Beowulf》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E.《Beowulf》by Unknown Translated by Francis Barton Gamer 24. Beowulf spake, Baron of Edge Theo. Lo, now, this booty, son of Haelifna, Lord of Shildings, we've lustily brought thee, sign of glory, thou seest it here. Not lightly did I with my life escape, and war under water this work I essayed with endless effort, and even so my strength had been lost, had the Lord not shielded me. Not a whit could I with hunting do in work of war, though the weapon is good, yet a sword the sovereign of men vouchsafed me to spy on the wall there, in splendor hanging old, gigantic, how oft he guides the fiendless wit. And I fought with that brand felling in fight since fate was with me, the house wardens. That war-sword then all burned, bright blade, when the blood gushed o'er it, battle sweat hot, but the hilt I brought back from my foes. So avenged I their fiendish deeds, deathfall of Danes, as was due and right. And this is my hest, that in Heorot now safe thou canst sleep, with thy soldier band, and every thane of all thy folk, both old and young, no evil fear. Shilding's lord, from that side again, aught ill for thy earls, as erst thou must. Then the golden hilt, for that gray-haired leader, hoary hero, in hand was laid, giant wrought, old. So owned and enjoyed it after downfall of devils, the Danish lord, wonder smith's work, since the world was rid of that grim-souled fiend, the foe of God, murder marked, and his mother as well. Now it passed into power of the people's king, best of all that the oceans bound, who have scattered their gold o'er Scandia's isle. Hrothgar spake, the hilt he viewed, heirloom old, where was etched the rise of that far-off fight, when the flood o'erwhelmed him, raging waves, the race of giants, fearful their fate, a folk estranged from God eternal, whence guardian due. Whence guardian due in that waste of waters, the wielder paid them, so on the guard of shining gold and rustic staves, it was rightly said for whom the serpent trace sword was wrought. Best of blades in bygone days, and the hilt well wound. The wise one spake, son of Halef de Nye. Silent were all. Lo, may he say who sooth and right follows midfolk, of far times mindful, a land warden old, that this earl belongs to the better breed, so oft aloft thy fame must fly, O friend of Beowulf, far and wide o'er folksteads many, firmly thou shalt all maintain, mighty strength with mood of wisdom, love of mine will I assure thee, as a while ago I promise thou shalt prove a stay in future, in far-off years to folk of thine, to the heroes a help, 
Was not Hera mowed thus to offspring, Aguela, honor shieldings, nor grew for their grace, but for grisly slaughter, for doom of death to the Danishmen? He slew wrath swollen, his shoulder comrades, companions at boar, so he passed alone, chieftain haughty from human cheer, though him the maker with might endowed, delights of power, and uplifted high above all men, yet blood fierced his mind, his breast hoard, grew, no bracelets gave he to Danes, as was due, he endured all joyless strain of struggle and stress and woe, long feud with his folk. Here find thy lesson, O future advise thee, this verse I have said for thee, wise from lapsed winters, wondrous seems, how to sons of men, almighty God, in the strength of his spirit, sendeth wisdom estate, high station, he swayeth all things, whiles he letteth right, lustily fare the heart of the hero of high-born race, and seat ancestral assigns him bliss, his folk's sure fortress and flee to hold, puts in his power great parts of the earth, empire so ample, that end of it this wanter of wisdom weaneth none. So he waxes in wealth, no wise can harm him, illness or age, no evil cares, shadow his spirit, no sword hate threatens from ever an enemy, all the world wends at his will, no worse he knoweth, till all within him obstinate pride waxes and waits while the warden slumbers, the spirit sentry sleep is too fast, which masters his might, and the murderer nears stealthily soothing the shafts from his bow. 25. Under harness his heart then is hit indeed by sharpest shafts, and no shelter avails from soul behest of the hellish fiend. Him sees too little what long he possessed. Greedy and grim, no golden ring he gives for his pride. The promised future forgets he and spurns with all God has sent him. Wonder wielder of wealth and fame, yet in the end it ever comes that the frame of the body fragile yields, fated falls, and there follows another, who joyously the jewels divides, the royal riches nor wrecks of the forebear. Ban then such baleful thoughts, Beowulf, dearest, best of men and the better part choose, profit eternal, and temper thy pride, warrior famous. The flower of thy might lasts now a while, but ere long it shall be that sickness or sword thy strength shall minish, or fang of fire, or flooding billow, or bite of blade, or brandished spear, or odious age, or the eye clear deem wax dull and darken. Death even thee in haste shall o'erwhelm, thou hero of war! So the ring Danes these half years a hundred I ruled, wielded neath Welkin, and warded them bravely from mighty ones many o'er Middle Earth, from spear and sword, till it seemed for me no foe could be found under fold of the sky. Lo, sudden the shift! To me seated secure came grief for joy when Grendel began to harry my home, the hellish foe. For those ruthless raids, unresting I suffered, heart sorrow heavy. Heaven be thanked, Lord Eternal, for life extended, that I on this head, all hewn and bloody, after long evil with eyes my gaze. Go to the bench now, be glad at banquet warrior worthy, a wealthy of treasure at dawn of day be dealt between us. Glad was the Gaiot's lord, going betimes to seek his seat as the sage commanded, afresh as before for the famed in battle, for the band of the hall was a banquet dight nobly anew. The night helm darkened dusk over the drinkers, the doughty ones rose, for the hoary head would hasten to rest, age shielding, and eager the Gaiot, shield fighter sturdy, for sleeping yearned, him wander wary, warrior guest from far, a hall thing heralded forth, who by custom courtly cared for all needs as a thane as in those old days warrior wanderers want to have. So slumbered the stout heart, stately the hall rose gabled and gilt, where the guests slept on till a raven black the rapture of heaven blithe heart boded. Bright came flying shine after shadow, 
The swordsmen hastened, athelings all were eager homeward forth to fare, and far from thence the great-hearted guest would guide his keel, bade then the hardy one hunting be brought to the son of Eklaf. The sword bade him take excellent iron, and uttered his thanks for it, quoth that he counted it keen in battle, war-friend winsome, with words he slandered not edge of the blade, t'was a big-hearted man. Now eager for parting, and armed at point, warriors waited, while went to his host that darling of Danes, the doughty Atheling, to high seat hasten, and Hrothgar greeted. 26. Beowulf spake, bairn of Edge Theo, Lo, we seafarers say our will, far come men, that we fain would seek Hialok now. We here have found hosts to our heart. Thou hast harbored us well. If ever on earth I am able to win me more of thy love, O Lord of men, aught anew that I now have done, for work of war I am willing still. If it come to me ever across the seas, that neighbor foemen annoy and fright thee as they that hate thee ere will have used, thousands then of thanes I shall bring, heroes to help thee. Of Hialak I know, ward of his folk, that though few his years, the lord of the Gaiots will give me aid, by word and by work, that well I may serve thee, wielding the war wooed to win thy triumph, and lending thee might, when thou lackest men. If thy Hrethik should come to courts of Gaiots, a sovereign son, he will surely there find his friends. A far off land each man should visit who vaunts him brave. Him then answering Hrothgar spake, These words of thine the wisest God sent to thy soul. No sager counsel from so young in years ere yet have I heard. Thou art strong of mane, and in mind art wary, art wise in words. I ween indeed, if ever it hap that Hrethel's heir by spear be seized, by sword grim battle, by illness or iron, thine elder and lord people's leader, and life be thine, no seemlier man will the sea Gaiots find at all to choose for their chief and king, for horde guard of heroes, if thou wilt thy kinsman kingdom. Thy keen mind pleases me the longer the better, Beowulf loved. Thou hast brought it about that both our peoples, sons of the Gaiot and spear Dane folk, shall have mutual peace, and from murderous strife such as once they wage from war refrain. Long as I rule this realm so wide, let our hordes be common, let heroes with gold each other greet o'er the gannet's bath, and the ringed prow bear o'er rolling waves tokens of love. I trow my landfolk towards friend and foe, and firmly joined an honor they keep in the olden way. To him in the hall, then Haleft and his son gave treasures twelve, and the trust of earls bade him fare with the gifts to his folk beloved, hail to his home, and in haste return. Then kissed the king of Ken renowned Shilding's chieftain, that choicest thane, and fell on his neck. Fast flowed the tears of the hoary headed, heavy with winters he had chases twain, but he clung to this that each should look on the other again, and hear him in hall. Was this hero so dear to him, his breast wild billows he banned in vain, safe in his soul a secret longing, locked in his mind, for that loved man burned in his blood? Then Beowulf strode, glad of his gold gifts, the grass plot or warrior blithe, the wave roamer bowed, riding at anchor, its owner awaiting, as they hastened onward, Hrothgar's gift they lauded at length. T'was a lord unpeered, every way blameless, till age had broken. It spareth no mortal his splendid might. End of section 9section 10 of beowulf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by tad e beowulf by unknown translated by francis barton gamer 27 
came now to ocean the ever-courageous hardy henchmen, their harness bearing woven war sarks. The warden marked, trusty as ever, the earl's return. From the height of the hill no hostile words reached the guests as he rode to greet them, but welcome he called to that wetter clan as the sheen-mailed spoilers to ship marched on, then on the strand with steeds and treasure and armor their roomy and ring-dight ship was heavily laden high its mast rose over hrothgar's hoarded gems a sword to the boat-guard beowulf gave mounted with gold on the mead bench since he was better esteemed that blade possessing heirloom old their ocean keel boarding they drove through the deep and daneland left a sea-cloth was set a sail with ropes firm to the mast, the flood timbers moaned. Nor did wind over billows that wave simmer blow across from her course. The craft sped on, foam necked, it floated forth o'er the waves, keel firm bound over briny currents, till they got them sight of the gayish cliffs, home known headlands. High the boat stirred by winds on the strand up drove. Helpful at haven the harbor guard stood, who long already for loved companions by the water had waited and watched afar. He bound to the beach the broad-bosomed ship with anchor bands, lest ocean billows that trusty timber should tear away. Then Beowulf bade them bear the treasure, gold and jewels. No journey far was it thence to go to the giver of rings, Hialak Hrethling. At home he dwelt by the sea wall close, himself and clan. Haughty that house, a hero the king, high the hall and herd right young, wise and wary, though winter's few in those fortress walls she had found a home, Hareth's daughter, nor humble her ways, nor grudge she gifts to the Gaiatish men, of precious treasure, not Theoreth's pride showed she, folk queen famed, or that fell deceit, was none so daring that durst make bold save her lord alone of the liegemen dear, that lady full in the face to look, but forged fetters he found his lot, bonds of death, and brief the respite, soon as they seized him his sword doom was spoken, and the burnished blade a baleful murder proclaimed and closed. No queenly way for woman to practice, though peerless she that the waver of peace from warrior dear by wrath and lying his life should reeve. But Hemming's kinsmen hindered this, for over their ale men also told, that of these folk horrors few she wrought, onslaught of evil after she went gold-becked bride to the brave young prince atheling haughty and offa's hall o'er the fallow flood at her father's bidding safely sought where since she prospered royal throned rich in goods fain of the fair life fate had sent her and leal of love to the lord of warriors he of all heroes I heard of ever, from sea to sea of the sons of earth most excellent seemed. Hence Offa was praised for his fighting, and feeing by far-off men, the spear-bold warrior, wisely he ruled over his empire. Aomer woke to him, help of heroes, Hemming's kinsman, grandson of Garmin, grim in war. 28. Hasten the hardy one, henchman with him, sandy strand of the sea to tread in widespread ways. The world's great candle sun shone from south. They strode along with sturdy steps to the spot they knew where the battle king young, his burge within, slayer of Anjan Theo, shared the rings, shelter of heroes to Heloch, Beowulf's coming was quickly told that there in the court the clansman's refuge, the shield companion, sound and alive, hail from the hero play homeward strode. With haste in the hall, by highest order room for the rovers was readily made, by his sovereign he sat, come safe from battle, kinsman by kinsman. His kindly lord he first had greeted in gracious form with many words. The mead dispensing came through the high hall, Hareth's daughter winsome to warriors, wine cup bore to the hands of the heroes. Heloch then, his comrade fairly with question plied in the lofty hall, sore longing to know what manner of sojourn the sea gaiots made. 
What came of thy quest, my kinsman Beowulf, when thy yearning suddenly swept thee yonder battle to seek o'er the briny sea, combat in Heorot? Hrothgar, couldst thou aid at all, the honored chief in his wide-known woes? With waves of care my sad heart seethed, I sore mistrusted my loved one's venture long, I begged thee by no means to seek thy slaughtering monster, but suffer the South Danes to settle their feuds themselves with Grendel. Now God be thanked that safe and sound I can see thee now. Beowulf spake, the baron of Edgetheo, Tis unknown and unhidden, Heelock Lord, to many men that meeting of ours struggle grim between Grendel and me, which we fought on the field where full to many sorrows he wrought, for the shielding victors, evils unending. These and I avenged, no boast can be breed of Grendel, any on earth for that uproar at dawn from the longest lived of the loathsome race in fleshly fold. But first I went Hrothgar to greet in the hall of gifts, where Halafdene's kinsman high renown, soon as my purpose was plain to him, assigned me a seat by his son and heir. The liegemen were lusty. My life days never such merry men over mead and hall have I heard under heaven. The high-born queen, people's peace-bringer, passed through the hall, cheered the young clansmen, clasps of gold, ere she sought her seat to sundry gave. Off to the heroes Hrothgar's daughter, to earls in turn, the ale-cup tendered, she whom I heard these hall companions, Freya Waro name, when fretted gold she preferred the warriors. Promised is she, gold-decked maid, to the glad son of Froda. Sage this seems to the Shilding's friend, kingdom's keeper, he counts it wise, the woman to wed, so and ward off feud, store of slaughter. But seldom ever were men are slain, does the murder spear sink, but briefest while, though the bride be fair. Nor haply will like it the heathaboard lord, as a little each of his liegemen all, when a thane of the Danes in that doughty throng, goes with the lady along their hall, and on him the old-time heirlooms glisten hard and ring-decked, heathabard's treasure, weapons that once they wielded fair until they lost at the linden play, liegemen leal, and their lives as well. Then over the ale, on their heirloom gazing, some ash-wielder old, who has all in mind that spear-death of men, he is stern of mood, heavy at heart, and the young hero tests the temper and tries the soul, and war-hate wakens with words like these, Ken that sword which to the fray thy father carried in his final feud, neath the fighting mask dearest of blades, when the Danish slew him and wielded the war-place on Withergild's fall, after havoc of heroes those hardy shieldings? Now the son of a certain slaughtering Dane, proud of his treasure, paces this hall, joys in the killing, and carries the jewel that rightfully ought to be owned by thee. Thus he urges and eggs him all the time with keenest words till occasion offers that Freya while rose thane for his father's deed after bite of brand and his blood must slumber, losing his life but that liegeman flies, living away for the land he kens, and thus be broken on both their sides oaths and earls when Ingild's breast wells with war-hate and wife-love now after the care billows cooler grows. So I hold not the Heathabard's faith due to the Danes, or their during love and pact of peace, but I pass from that turning to Grendel, O giver of treasure and saying in full how the fight resulted, hand fray of heroes, when heaven's jewel had fled o'er far fields that fierce sprite came, night foe savage to seek us out, where safe and sound we sentried the hall. To Hanskio then, was that harassing deadly, his fall there was fated, his first was slain, girded warrior. Grendel on him turned murderous mouth on our mighty kinsmen, and all the brave man's body devoured. Yet none the earlier empty-handed would the bloody-toothed murderer, mindful of bale, outward go from the gold-decked hall. But me he attacked in his terror of might, 
with greedy hand grasped me, a glove hung by him, wide and wondrous, wound with bands, and in artful wise it all was wrought by devilish craft of dragon skins. Me therein an innocent man the fiendish foe was fain to thrust with many another. He might not so when I all angrily upright stood, there long to relate how that land destroyer I paid in kind for his cruel deeds, yet there, my prince, this people of thine got fame by my fighting. He fled away, and a little space his life preserved. But there stayed right him, his stronger hand, left in Heorot, heart-sick thence on the floor of the ocean that outcast fell. Me for this struggle the Shilding's friend paid in plenty with plates of gold, with many a treasure when morn had come, and we all at the banquet board sat down. Then was song and glee, the gray-haired Shilding much tested, told of these times of yore, whilst the hero his heart bestirred, wood of delight, now lays he chanted of sooth and sadness, or set aright legends of wonder, the wide-hearted king, or the years of his youth he would yearn at times for strength of struggles, now stricken with age, hoary hero. His heart surged full, when wise with winters he wailed their flight. Thus in the hall the whole of that day at ease we feasted, till fell o'er earth another night. Anon full ready in greed of vengeance, Grendel's mother set forth all doleful, Dead was her son, through war-hate of wetters, now woman monstrous, with fury fell a foeman she slew, avenged her offspring. From Asherah old, loyal counselor, life was gone, nor might they e'en when morning broke those Danish people, their death doomed comrade burn with brands, on balefire lay the man they mourned under mountain stream. She had carried the corpse with cruel hands. For Hrothgar, that was the heaviest sorrow of all that had laden the lord of his folk. The leader then, by thy life, besought me. Sad was his soul, and the sea waves coil to play the hero and hazard my being. For glory of prowess, my guerdon he pledged. I then in the waters tis widely known that sea-floor guardian savage found. Hand to hand, there a while we struggled, billows welled blood in the briny hall. Her head I hewed with a hardy blade from Grendel's mother, and gained my life, though not without danger. My doom was not yet. Then the haven of heroes, Haleftina's son, gave me and Gurdon great gifts of price. 29. So held this king to the customs old, that I wanted for naught in the wage I gained the meed of my might. He made me gifts, Haleftina's heir, for my own disposal. Now to thee, my prince, I prefer them all, gladly give them. Thy grace alone can find me favor. Few indeed have I of kinsmen, save he luck thee. Then he bade them bear him the boarhead standard, the battle helm high and breastplate gray, the splendid sword. Then spake in form, me this war gear, the wise old prince Hrothgar gave, and his hest, he added, that its story be straightway said to thee. A while it was held by Heragar, king, for long time told of the land of Shildings, yet not to his son the sovereign left it, to daring Heovard, dear as he was to him, his harness of battle. Well, hold thou it all! And I heard that soon passed o'er the path of this treasure, all apple fallow, four good steeds, each like the others, arms and horses, he gave to the king. So should kinsmen be, not weave one another the net of wiles, or with deep-hid treachery, death contrive for neighbor and comrade. His nephew was ever by Heelock held full dear, and each kept watch o'er the other's wheel. I heard, too, the necklace to Herg he presented, wonder-wrought treasure, which Walsh Theo gave him sovereign daughter. Three steeds he added, slender and saddle gray, since such gift the gem gleamed bright on the breast of the queen. Thus showed his strain the son of Edge Theo, as a man remarked for mighty deeds and acts of honor. 
At ale he slew not comrade or kin, nor cruel his mood, though of sons of earth his strength was greatest, a glorious gift that God had sent the splendid leader. Long was he spurned, and worthless by Gaetish warriors held. Him at mead the master of clans failed full off to favor at all. Slack and shiftless the strong men deemed him, profitless prince, but payment came to the warrior honored for all his woes. Then the bulwark of earls bade bring within hardy chieftain Hrethel's heirloom, garnished with gold, no guyot e'er known in shape of a sword, a statelier prize. The brand he laid in Beowulf's lap, and of hides assigned him seven thousand, with house and high seat. They held in common land alike, by their line of birth, inheritance, home. But higher the king because of his rule o'er the realm itself. Now further it fell with the flight of years, with harryings horrid, that Heoloch perished, and Hardred, too, the hewing of swords under the shield wall slaughtered lay, when him at the van of the victor folk sought hardy heroes, Hethos Skilfings and arms o'erwhelming Hereric's nephew. Then Beowulf came as king this broad realm to wield, and he ruled it well fifty winters, a wise old prince warding his land, until one began in the dark of night a dragon to rage. In the grave on the hill a hoard it guarded, in the stone barrow steep. A straight path reached it unknown to mortals. Some man, however, chance by chance, that cave within to the heathen hoard. In hand he took a golden goblet, nor gave he it back, stole with it away while the watcher slept by thievish wiles for the warden's wrath prince and people must pay betimes end of section 10section 11 of beowulf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by tad e Beowulf by Unknown Translated by Francis Barton Gamere 30. That way he went, with no will of his own, in danger of life to the dragon's horde, but for pressure of peril, some prince's thane, he fled in fear the fatal scourge, seeking shelter a sinful man, and entered it, at the awful sight, tottered that guest, and terror seized him. Yet the wretched fugitive rallied anon from fright and fear ere he fled away, and took the cup from that treasure hoard. Of such besides there was store enough, heirlooms old, the earth below, which some earl forgotten in ancient years left the last of his lofty race, heedfully there, had hidden away dearest treasure." For death of yore had hurried all hence, and he alone left to live, the last of the clan, weeping his friends, yet wished to bide, warding the treasure, his one delight, though brief his respite. The barrow, new ready, to strand and sea wave, stood anear, hard by the headland, hidden and closed, there laid within its lordly heirlooms, and heaped hoard of heavy gold, that warden of rings, few words he spake now hold thou earth since heroes may not what earls have owned lo erst from thee brave men brought it but battle death seized and cruel killing my clansmen all robbed them of life and a liegeman's joy none have i to lift the sword or to cleanse the carven cup of prince speaker bright my brave are gone and the helmet hard all haughty with gold shall part from its plotting polishers sleep who could brighten and burnish the battle mask and those weeds of war that were wont to brave over bicker of shields the bite of steel rust with their bearer the ringed mail fares not far with famous chieftain at side of hero no harp's delight no glee wood's gladness no good hawk now flies through the hall nor horse's fleet stamp in the burgsteed battle and death the flower of my race have reft away mournful of mood thus he moaned his woe alone for them all and unblithe wept by day and by night till death's fell wave o'erwhelmed his heart 
his hoard of bliss, that old ill-doer open found, who, blazing at twilight, the barrows haunteth, naked foe dragon flying by night. Folded in fire the folk of earth, dread him sore, tis his doom to seek, hoard in the graves and heathen gold, to watch many wintered nor winds he thereby. Powerful this plague of people thus, held the house of the hoard in earth, three hundred winters till one aroused, wrath in his breast to the ruler bearing, that costly cup and the king implored, for bond of peace so the barrow was plundered, born off was booty, his boon was granted, that wretched man and his ruler saw first time what was fashioned in far-off days. When the dragon awoke, new woe was kindled, o'er the stone he snuffed, the stark heart found footprint of foe who so far had gone in his hidden craft by the creature's head. So may the undoomed easily flee, evils and exile, if only he gain, the grace of the wielder, that warden of gold o'er the ground went seeking greedy to find the man who wrought him such wrong in sleep. Savage and burning the barrow he circled, all without, nor was any there, none in the waste, yet war he desired, was eager for battle, the barrow he entered, sought the cup and discovered soon, that some one of mortals had searched his treasure, his lordly gold, the guardian waited, ill enduring, till evening came, Boiling with wrath was the barrow's keeper, and fain with flame the foe to pay, for the dear cup's loss. Now day was fled as the worm had wished. By its wall no more was it glad to bide, but burning flew, folded in flame, a fearful beginning for sons of the soil, and soon it came, in the doom of their lord, to a dreadful end. 31. Then the baleful fiend, its fire belched out and bright homes burned. The blaze stood high, all landfolk frighting. No living thing would that loathly one leave as aloft it flew. Wide was the dragon's warring seen, its fiendish fury far and near, as the grim destroyer those gaitish people hated and hounded. To hidden lair to its hoard it hastened a hint of dawn. Folk of the land it had lapped in flame with bale and brand, in its barrow it trusted its battling and bulwarks. That boast was vain. To Beowulf, then, the bale was told, quickly and truly, the king's own home. Of buildings the best in brand waves melted, that gift throne of Gaiots, to the good old man sad in heart. T'was heaviest sorrow, the sage assumed that his sovereign god he had angered, breaking ancient law and embittered the lord, his breast within with black thoughts welled, as his want was never. The folk's own fastness that fiery dragon with flame had destroyed, and the stronghold all washed by waves, but the warlike king, prince of the wetters, plotted vengeance. Warriors bulwark he bade them work, all of iron, the earl's commander, a war-shield wondrous, well he knew that forest wood against fire were worthless, linden could aid not. Atheling brave, he was fated to finish this fleeting life, his days on earth, and the dragon with him, though long it had watched o'er the wealth of the hoard. Shame he reckoned it, sharer of rings, to follow the flyer afar with a host, a broad-flung band, nor the battle feared he, nor deemed he dreadful the dragon's warring, its vengeance and valor, ventures desperate he had passed a plenty and perils of war, contest crashed, since conqueror proud Hrothgar's hall he had wholly purged, and in grapple had killed the kin of Grendel, loathsome breed. Not least was that of hand-to-hand -hand fights, where Heluk fell, when the ruler of Gaiots in rush of battle, lord of his folk, in the Frisian land, son of Hrethel, by sword draughts died by brands down beaten. Thence Beowulf fled through strength of himself and his swimming power, though alone, and his arms were laden with thirty coats of mail when he came to the sea. Nor yet might Hetwaris haughtily boast their craft of contest, who carried against him shields to the fight, but few escape from strife with the hero to seek their homes. 
Then swam over ocean edged Theo's son, lonely and sorrowful, seeking his land, where Hig made him offer of hoard and realm, rings and royal seat, reckoning not the strength of her son to save their kingdom from hostile hordes after Heloch's death. No sooner for this could the stricken ones in any wise move that Atheling's mind over young hard dreads head as lord and ruler of all the realm to be, Yet the hero upheld him with helpful words, aided in honor, till older grown he wielded the wetter gaiets. Wandering exiles sought him o'er seas, the sons of Oterre, who had spurned the sway of the Skilfing's helmet, the bravest and best that broke the rings in Swedish land, of the sea king's line haughty hero, hence hard dreads end, for shelter he gave them, sword death came, the blades fell blow, to bairn of Heloch, but the son of Anjan Theos sought again house and home when hard dread fell, leaving Beowulf, lord of Gaiats, and Githseat's master, a good king he. 32. The fall of his lord was fain to requite in after days, and to Aya Gilles he proved friend to the friendless, and forces sent over the sea to the son of Oterre. Weapons and warriors well repaid he, those care paths cold when the king he slew. Thus safe through struggles the son of Edgtheo had passed a plenty through perils dire. When daring deeds till this day was come that doomed him now with the dragon to strive. With comrades eleven the lord of Gaia, swollen in rage, went seeking the dragon. He had heard whence all the harm arose, and the killing of clansmen, the cup of price, on the lap of the Lord had been paid by the finder. In the throng was this one thirteenth man, starter of all the strife and ill, care-laden captive, cringing thence, forced and reluctant. He led them on till he came in ken of the carven hall, the barrow delved near billowy surges, flood of ocean. Within t'was full of wire gold and jewels and jealous warden, warrior trusty, the treasures held, lurked in his lair. Not light the task of entrance for any of earth-born men. Set on the headland the hero king spake words of hail to his hearth companions, gold friend of Gaiots. All gloomy his soul, wavering, death-bound, word full nigh stood ready to greet the gray-haired man to seize his soul hoard, sunder apart life and body. Not long would be the warrior spirit and wound with flesh. Beowulf spake, the bairn of Edgtheo. Through store of struggles I strove in youth, mighty feuds. I mind them all. I was eleven years old when the sovereign of kings, friend of his folk from my father, took me, had me, and held me, Hrethel the king, with food and fee, faithful in kinship, ne'er well I lived there, he loathlier found me, bairn in the burge, than his birthright sons, Erebald, and Hothkin, and Heloch mine, for the eldest of these, by unmeet chance, by kinsman's deed, was the deathbed strewn, when Hothkin killed him with horny bow, his own dear liege laid low with an arrow, missed the mark, and his mate shot down, one brother the other, with bloody shaft. A feeless fight and a fearful sin, horror to Hrethel, yet hard as it was, unavenged, must the atheling die. Too awful it is for an aged man to bide and bear that his bairn so young rides on the gallows, a rhyme he makes, sorrow song for his son, there hanging as rapture of ravens. No rescue now can come from the old, disabled man. Still is he minded, as morning breaks, of the air gone elsewhere, another he hopes not. He will bide to see his burge within, as ward for his wealth, now the one has found doom of death that the deed incurred. Forlorn he looks on the lodge of his son, wine-hall waste, and wind-swept chambers reft of revel. The rider steepeth the hero far hidden, no harp resounds in the courts, no assail as once was heard. End of section 11
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamer. 33. Then he goes to his chamber, a grief song chants alone for his loss. Too large all seems, homestead and house, so the helmet of wetters hid in his heart for Herebald waves of woe. No way could he take to avenge on the slayer slaughter so foul, nor in could he harass that hero at all with loathsome deed, though he loved him not. And so for the sorrow his soul endured, man's gladness he gave up, and God's light chose, lands and cities he left his sons, as the wealthy do when he went from earth. There was strife and struggle, twixt Swede and Gaet, o'er the width of waters war arose, hard battle horror when Hrethel died, and on Gentheo's offspring grew strife keen, bold, nor brooked o'er the seas, packed of peace, but pushed their hosts to harass in hatred by Hreosnaberk, Men of my old, for that feud had vengeance, for woeful war tis widely known, though one of them bought it with blood of his heart, a bargain hard for hath can proved fatal that fray. For the first of Gaiots, at morn I heard, was the murderer killed by kinsmen for kinsmen, with clash of sword, when Angentheo met Eover there. Wide split the war helm, wan he fell, hoary skilfing, the hand that smote him of feud was mindful, nor flinched from the death blow. For all that he gave me my gleaming sword repaid him at war, such power I wielded, for lordly treasure with land he entrusted me, homestead and house, he had no need from Swedish realm, or from spear Dane folk, or from men of the gifts, to get him help some warriors worse for wage to buy. Ever I fought in front of all, soul to the fore, and so shall I fight while I bide in life, and this blade shall last that early and late hath royal proof since for my doughtiness. Day Hreven fell, slain by my hand, the Huggish champion, nor fared he thence to the Frisian king with the booty sack and breast adornments, but slain in struggle that standard bearer fell, atheling brave. Not with blade was he slain, but his bones were broken by brawny gripe. His heart waves still, the sword edge now, hard blade in my hand, for the horde shall strive. Beowulf spake, and a battle vow made, his last of all. I have lived through many wars in my youth. Now once again, old folk defender, feud will I seek, do doughty deeds, if the dark destroyer forth from his cavern comes to fight me. Then hailed he the helmeted hero all for the last time, greeting his liegemen dear, comrades of war. I should carry no weapon, no sword to the serpent, if sure I knew how, with such enemy, else my vows I could gain as I did in Grendel's day. But fire in this fight, I must fear me now, and poisonous breath, so I bring with me breastplate and board. From the barrow's keeper no foot-breath flee I. One fight shall end our war by the wall, as word allots all mankind's master, my mood is bold, but forbears to boast o'er this battle flyer. Now abide by the barrow, ye breastplate mailed, ye heroes in harness, which of us twain better from battle rush bear his wounds. Wait ye the finish, the fight is not yours, nor meet for any but me alone to measure might with this monster here and play the hero. Hardily I shall win that wealth, or war shall seize cruel killing your king and lord. Up stood then with shield the sturdy champion stayed by the strength of his single manhood, and hardy neath helmet his harness bore under cleft of the cliffs no coward's path.
Soon spied by the wall that warrior chief, survivor of many a victory field, when foemen fought with furious clashings, an arch of stone, and within a stream that broke from the barrow. The brooklet's waves was hot with fire, the horde that way he never could hope unharmed to near, or endure those deeps for the dragon's flame. Then let from his breast, for he burst with rays, the wetter guyot prince, a word outgo, storm the stark heart stern went ringing and clear his cry neath the cliff rocks gray the horde guard heard a human voice his rage was enkindled no respite now for pact of peace the poison breath of that foul worm first came forth from the cave hot reeking of fight the rocks resounded stout by the stone way his shield he raised lord of the guyots against the loathed one while with courage keen that coiled foe came seeking strife, the sturdy king had drawn his sword, not dull of edge, heirloom old, and each of the two felt fear of his foe, though fierce their mood. Stoutly stood with his shield raised high the warrior king, and the worm now coiled together amain. The mailed one waited. Now spire by spire, fast sped and glided that blazing serpent, the shield protected soul and body a shorter while for the hero king than his heart desired. Could his will have wielded the welcome respite but once in his life, but word denied it in victory's honors. His arm he lifted, lord of the guyots, the grim foe smote with atheling heirloom, its edge was turned brown blade on the bone, and bit more feebly than its noble master had need of then in his baleful stress. Then the barrower's keeper waxed full wild for that weighty blow, cast deadly flames wide drove and far, those vicious fires. No victor's glory the guyot's lord boasted. His brand had failed naked in battle, as never it should, excellent iron. "'Twas no easy path that Edgetheo's honored heir "'must tread over the plain to the place of the foe, "'for against his will he must win a home elsewhere far, "'as must all men leaving this lapsing life. "'Not long it was ere those champions grimly closed again. "'The horde guard was heartened, high heaved his breast once more, "'and by peril was pressed again and folded in flames the folk commander.' nor yet about him his band of comrades sons of athelings armed stood with warlike front to the woods they bent them their lives to save but the soul of one with care was cumbered kinsmen true can never be marred in a noble mind thirty four we laugh his name was welchstan's son lindenthane loved the lord of skilfings alfhera's kinsman his king he now saw with heat under helmet hard oppressed. He minded the prizes his prince had given him, wealthy seat of the wagemunding line, and folk rights that his father owned. Not long he lingered, the linden yellow his shield, he seized the sword he drew, as heirloom of iron mund, earth dwellers knew it, who was slain by the sword edge, son of Otir, friendless exile, erst in fray, Killed by which Stan, who won for his kin, brown bright helmet, breastplate ringed, old sword of Etten's, Onola's gift, weeds of war of the warrior thane, battle gear brave, though a brother's child had been felled, the feud was unfelt by Onola. For winters this war gear, wet Stan kept breastplate and board, till his bairn had grown earlship to earn, as the old sire did. Then he gave him, mid guyots, the gear of battle, portion huge, when he passed from life, fared aged forth. For the first time now with his leader lord, the liegeman young, was bidden to share the shrokek of battle. Neither softened his soul, nor the sire bequest weakened in war. So the worm found out, when once in fight the foes had met, Wheelof spake, and his words were sage, sad in spirit, he said to his comrades, I remember the time when mead we took what promise we made to this prince of ours in the banquet hall to our breaker of rings for gear of combat to heal him requital, for hard sword and helmet, if hap should bring stress of this sort, 
Himself who chose us from all his army to aid him now, urged us to glory, and gave these treasures because he counted us keen with the spear, and hardy neath helm, though this hero work our leader hoped unhelped and alone to finish for us. Folk defender, who hath got him glory greater than all men for daring deeds. Now the day is come that our noble master has need of the might of warrior stout, let us stride along, the hero to help while the heat is about him, glowing and grim. For God is my witness, I am far more fain the fire should seize along with my lord these limbs of mine. Unsuiting it seems our shields to bear homeward hence, save here we essay to fell the foe and defend the life of the wedder's lord. I wot twere shame on the law of our land if alone the king out of Gaiatish warriors woe endured and sank in the struggle. My sword and helmet, breastplate and board for us both shall serve. Through slaughter reek strode he to secure his chieftain. His battle helm bore and brief words spake. Beowulf, dearest, do all bravely as in youthful days of yore thou vowedst that while life should last thou wouldst let no wise thy glory droop. Now great in deeds, atheling steadfast with all thy strength, shield thy life, I will stand to help thee. At the words the worm came once again, murderous monster mad with rage, with fire billows flaming its foe to seek, the hated men, and heat waves burned that board, to the boss and the breastplate failed to shelter at all the spear thane young. Yet quickly under his kinsman's shield went eager the earl, since his own was now all burned by the blaze. The bold king again had mind of his glory, with might his glaive was driven into the dragon's head. Blow nerved by hate. But nail ing was shivered, broken in battle was Beowulf's sword, old and gray. Twas granted him not that ever the edge of iron at all could help him at strife, too strong was his hand, so the tale is told, and he tried too far with strength of stroke all swords he wielded, though sturdy their steel, they steaded him not. Then for the third time thought on its feud, that folk destroyer, fire dread dragon, and rushed on the hero, where room allowed battle grim burning, its bitter teeth closed on his neck, and covered him with waves of blood from his breast that welled. 35. Twas now, men say, in his sovereign's need, that the earl made known his noble strain, craft and keenness, and courage enduring. Heedless of harm, though his hand was burned, hardy-hearted, he helped his kinsman. A little lower the loathsome beast he smote with sword, his steel drove in, bright and burnished. That blaze began to loose and lessen. At last the king wielded his wits again, war knife drew, a biting blade by his breastplate hanging, and the wetter's helm smote that worm asunder, felled the foe, flung forth its life. So had they killed it, kinsmen both, atheling twain, thus an earl should be in danger's day. Of deeds of valor this conqueror's hour of the king was last of his work in the world. The wound began which that dragon of earth had erst inflicted to swell and smart, and soon he found in his breast was boiling, baleful and deep, pain of poison. The prince walked on, wise in his thought, to the wall of rock, then sat and stared at the structure of giants, where arch of stone and steadfast column upheld forever that hall and earth. Yet here must the hand of the henchman peerless lave with water his winsome lord, the king and conqueror covered with blood, with struggle spent, and unspan his helmet. Beowulf spake in spite of his hurt, his mortal wound, full well he knew his portion now was past and gone, of earthly bliss, and all had fled of his file of days, and death was near. I would fain bestow on son of mine this gear of war were given me now, than any heir should after me of my proper blood. This people I ruled fifty winters, no folk king was there, none at all of the neighboring clans who war would wage me with warriors' friends, and threat me with horrors. At home I bided what fate might come, and I cared for mine own. Feuds I sought not, nor falsely swore ever on oath, for all these things, though fatally found, fain am I. 
From the ruler of man no wrath shall seize me, when life from my frame must flee away for killing of kinsmen. Now quickly go and gaze on that hoard neath the hoary rock we love loved. Now the worm lies low, sleeps, heart sore of his spoil bereaved, and fair in haste I would fain behold the gorgeous heirlooms, golden store, have joy in the jewels and gems, lay down softlier for sight of this splendid hoard, my life, and the lordship I long have held. End of section 12section 13 of beowulf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by tad e beowulf by unknown translated by francis barton gamer 36 i have heard that swiftly the son of wetstan at wish and word of his wounded king war sick warrior woven mail coat battle sark bore neath the barrow's roof then the clansman king of conquest proud passing the seat saw store of jewels and glistening gold the ground along by the wall were marvels and many a vessel in the den of the dragon the dawn flyer old unburnished boughs of bygone men reft of richness rusty helms of the olden age and arm rings many wondrously woven such wealth of gold booty from barrow can burden with pride each human wit let him hide it who will his glance too fell on a gold wove banner high o'er the hoard of handiwork noblest brilliantly broidered so bright its gleam all the earth floor he easily saw and viewed all the vessels no vestige now was seen of the serpent the sword had taken him then i heard the hill of its hoard was reft old work of giants by one alone he burdened his bosom with beakers and plate at his own good will and the ensign took brightest of beacons the blade of his lord its edge was iron and injured deep one that guarded the golden hoard many a year and its murder fire spread hot round the barrow in horror billows at midnight hour till it met its doom hasted the herald the horde so spurred him his track to retrace he was troubled by doubt high-souled hero if haply he'd find alive where he left him the lord of wetters weakening fast by the wall of the cave so he carried the load his lord and king he found all bleeding famous chief at the lapse of life the liegeman again plashed him with water till point of word broke through the breast hoard Beowulf spake, sage and sad, as he stared at the gold. For the golden treasure, to God my thanks, to the wielder of wonders with words I say, for what I behold to heaven's Lord, for the grace that I give such gifts to my folk, or ever the day of my death be run. Now I've bartered here for booty of treasure, the last of my life, so look ye well to the needs of my land. No longer I tarry a barrow bid ye the battle feigned raise for my ashes twill shine by the shore of the flood to folk of mine memorial fair on hrone's headland high uplifted that ocean wanderers oft may hail beowulf barrow as back from far they drive their heels o'er the darkling wave from his neck he unclasped the collar of gold valorous king to his vassal gave it with bright gold helmet breastplate and ring to the youthful thane bade him use them in joy thou art end and remnant of all our race the wagmunding name for word hath swept them all my line to the land of doom earls in their glory i after them go this word was the last which the wise old man harbored in heart ere hot death waves of baleful he chose from his bosom fled his soul to seek the saint's reward 37. It was heavy hap for that hero young, on his lord beloved, to look and find him lying on earth with life at end, sorrowful sight. But the slayer too, awful earth dragon, empty of breath, lay felled in fight, nor fain of its treasure could the writhing monster rule it more. For edges of iron had ended its days hard and battle sharp, hammers leaving, and that flyer afar, 
had fallen to ground, hushed by its hurt, its hoard all near, no longer lusty aloft to whirl at midnight, making its merriment seem proud of its prizes. Prone it sank by the handiwork of the hero king, forsooth among folk but few achieve, though sturdy and strong, as stories tell me, and never so daring indeed of valor, the perilous breath of a poisoned foe, to brave and to rush on the ring-board hall, whenever his watch the warden keeps, bold in the barrow. Beowulf paid the price of death for that precious hoard, and each of the foes had found the end of this fleeting life, befell ere long that the laggards in war the wood had left, toothbreakers, cowards, ten together, fearing before the flourish a spear in the sore distress of their sovereign lord. Now in their shame their shields they carried, armor of fight where the old man lay, and they gazed on Wheelof, wearied he sat at his sovereign's shoulder, shieldsman good, to wake him with water. No wise it availed, though well he wished it, and world no more could he barrier life for that leader of battles, nor baffle the will of all-wielding God. Doom of the Lord was law o'er the deeds of every man as it is today. Grim was the answer, easy to get, from the youth for those that had yielded to fear. Wheelof spake, the son of Wetchstan. Mournful he looked on those men unloved. Who, sooth, will speak, can say indeed that the ruler who gave you golden rings, and the harness of war in which ye stand, for he at ale bench oftentimes bestowed on hall folk helm and breastplate, lord to liegemen, the likeliest gear which near of far he could find to give, threw away and wasted these weeds of battle, of men who failed when the foemen came. Not at all could the king of his comrades in arms venture to vaunt, though the victory wielder God gave him grace that he got revenge, soul with his sword in stress and need. To rescue his life t'was little that I could serve him in struggle, yet shift I made, hopeless it seemed, to help my kinsmen. Its strength ever waned, when with weapon I struck that fatal foe, and the fire less strongly flowed from its head. Too few the heroes in throw of contest that thronged to our king. Now gift of treasure and girded of sword, joy of the house and home delight shall fail your folk. His freehold land every clansman with your kin shall lose and leave. When lords high-born hear afar of that flight of yours, a fameless deed, Yea, dead is better for liegemen, all than a life of shame. 38. That battle toil bade he at Burge to announce, at the fort of the cliff where, full of sorrow, all the morning earls had sat, daring shieldsmen in doubt of twain. Would they wail as dead, or welcome home their lord beloved? Little kept back of the tidings new, but told them all the herald that up the headland rode. Now the willing giver to wetter folk in deathbed lies, the lord of Gaiots, on the slaughter bed sleeps by the serpent's deed. And beside him is stretched that slayer of men with knife wounds sick, no sword availed on the awesome thing in any wise to work a wound. There Wheelof sitteth, Wet stands bairn by Beowulf's side, the living earl by the other dead, and heavy of heart a head watch keeps o'er friend and foe. Now our folk may look for waging of war when once unhidden to Frisian, and Frank the fall of the king is spread afar. The strife began when hot on the Huggis, Helok fell and fared with his fleet to the Frisian land, him there the Hetwaris, humbled in war, plied with such prowess their power o'erwhelming, that the bold in battle bowed beneath it and fell in fight. To his friends no wise could that earl give treasure, and ever since the Marrowing's favor has failed us wholly. Nor aught expect I of peace and faith from Swedish folk, 
twas spread afar, how on Gentheo, reft at raven's wood, hath kin wrestling of hope and life, when the folk of Gaiots for the first time sought and wanton pride the warlike skilfings. Soon the sage old sire of Otir, ancient and awful, gave answering blow. The sea king he slew and his spouse redeemed, his good wife rescued, though robbed of her gold, mother of Otir and Anala. Then he followed his foes who fled before him, sore beset and stole their way, bereft of a ruler to Ravenswood. With his hosts he besieged there what swords had left, the weary and wounded. Woes he threatened the whole night through to that hard-pressed throng. Some with the morrow his sword should kill, some should go to the gallows tree for rapture of ravens. But rescue came and dawn and day for those desperate men when they heard the horn of Heloch's sound, tones of his trumpet, the trusty king had followed their trail with faithful band. End of section 13《Section 13 14 of Beowulf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tad E. Beowulf by Unknown. Translated by Francis Barton Gamere. 39. The bloody swath of Swedes and Gaiots and the storm of their strife were seen afar. How folk against folk the fight had wakened. The ancient king with his atheling band sought his citadel, sorrowing much. On Gen Theo Earl went up to his burge. He had tested Heloch's hardihood, the proud one's prowess, would prove it no longer, defied no more those fighting wanderers, nor hoped from the seamen to save his hoard, his bairn and his bride. So he bent him again, old, to his earth walls, Yet after him came with slaughter for Swedes the standards of Heloch, or peaceful plains in pride advancing, till Hrethlings fought in the fenced town. Then on Gentheo with edge of sword the hoary bearded was held at bay, and the folk king there was forced to suffer Eover's anger. In ire at the king, Wolf Wanredding with weapon struck, and the chieftain's blood for that blow and streams flowed neath his hair. No fear felt he, stout old Skilfing, but straightway repaid in better bargain that bitter stroke and faced his foe with fell intent. Nor swift enough was the son of Wanred, answer to render the aged chief, too soon on his head the helm was cloven. Blood bedecked he bowed to earth and fell adown, not doomed was he yet, and well he waxed, though the wound was sore. Then the hardy Heloch Thane, when his brother fell with broad brand smote, giant's sword crashing through giant's helm, across the shield wall, sank the king, his folk's old herdsman, fatally hurt. There were many to bind the brother's wounds and lift him, fast as fate allowed his people to wield the peace of war. But Eover took, from Anjan Theo, Earl from other, the iron breastplate, hard sword hilted and helmet too, and the whore chief's harness to Heloch carried, who took the trappings and truly promised rich fee mid folk, and fulfill it so. For that grim strife gave Gaiatish lord Hrethel's offspring, when home he came to Eover and Wolf a wealth of treasure, each of them had a hundred thousand in land and linked rings, nor at less price reckoned mid earth men such mighty deeds. And to Eover he gave his only daughter in, in pledge of grace the pride of his home. Such is the feud, the foeman's rage, death hate of men. So I deem it sure that the Swedish folk will seek us home, for this fall of their friends, the fighting skilfings, when once they learn that our warrior leader, lifeless lies, who land and hoard, ever defended from all his foes, furthered his folk's wealth, finished his course a hardy hero, now haste is best, that we go to gaze on our Gaiatish lord, and bear the bountiful breaker of rings to the funeral pyre. No fragments merely shall burn with the warrior, 
wealth of jewels, gold untold and gained in terror, treasure at last with his life obtained, all of that booty the brand shall take, fire shall eat it. No earl must carry memorial jewel, no maiden fair shall wreathe her neck with noble ring, nay, sad in spirit and shorn of her gold, off shall she pass o'er paths of exile, now our Lord all laughter has laid aside, all mirth and revel. Many a spear, morning cold, shall be clasped amain, lifted aloft. Nor shall lilt of harp those warriors wake, but the wane-hewn raven, fain o'er the fallen, his feast shall praise and boast to the eagle how bravely he ate when he and the wolf were wasting the slain. So he told his sorrowful tidings, and little he lied, the loyal man of word or of work. The warriors rose sad. They climbed to the cliff of eagles, went welling the tears, the wonder to view, found on the sand there, stretched at rest, their lifeless lord, who had lavished rings of old upon them. Ending day had dawned on the doughty one. Death had seized in woeful slaughter the wetter's king, there saw they, besides the strangest being, loathsome, lying their leader near, prone on the field. The fiery dragon, fearful fiend, with flame was scorched. Reckoned by feet it was fifty measures in length as it lay. Aloft erewhile it had reveled by night, and anon come back, seeking its den. Now in death's sure clutch it had come to the end of its earth-hall joys. By it there stood the stoops and jars, dishes lay there, and deer-decked swords eaten with rust, as on earth's lap resting. A thousand winters they waited there. For all that heritage huge, that gold of bygone men, was bound by a spell, so the treasure hall could be touched by none of humankind, save that heaven's king God himself might give whom he would, helper of heroes the hoard to open even such a man as seemed to meet him. 40. A perilous path it proved, he trod, who heinously hid, that hall within, wealth under wall. Its watcher had killed one of a few, and the feud was avenged in woeful fashion. Wondrous seemed it what manner a man of might and valor oft ends his life, when the earl no longer in mead hall may live with loving friends. So Beowulf, when that barrow's warden he sought, and the struggle, himself knew not in what wise he should wend from the world at last. For princes potent, who placed the gold with a curse to doomsday, covered it deep, so that marked with sin the man should be, hedged with horrors and hell bonds fast, racked with plagues who should rob their hoard. Yet no greed for gold but the grace of heaven ever the king had kept in view. Wheelof spake, the son of Wetchstan. At the mandate of one, oft warriors many sorrow must suffer, and so must we. The people's shepherd showed not aught of care for our counsel, king beloved. That guardian of gold he should grapple not, urged we, but let him lie where he long had been, in his earth hall waiting the end of the world, the rest of heaven. The hoard is ours, but grievously gotten, too grim the fate which thither carried our king and lord. I was within there, and all I viewed, the chambered treasure whence chance allowed me, and my path was made in no pleasant wise under the earth wall. Eager I seized such heap from the hoard as hands could bear, and hurriedly carried it hither back to my liege and lord. Alive was he still, Still wielding his wits, the wise old man spake much in his sorrow, and sent you greetings, and bade that ye build, when he breathed no more, on the place of his balefire a barrow high, memorial mighty. Of men he was worthiest warrior wide earth o'er, the while he had joy of his jewels and burge. Let us set out in haste now, the second time to see and search the store of treasure. These wall hid wonders, the way I show you, where gathered near ye may gaze your fill at broad gold and rings. Let the beer, soon made, be all in order, when out we come, our king and captain to carry thither. 
Man beloved, where long he shall bide, safe in the shelter of sovereign God. Then the bairn of Wetchstan bade command, hardy chief to heroes many, that owned their homesteads, hither to bring firewood from far o'er the folk they ruled, for the famed one's funeral. Fire shall devour, and wan flames feed on the fearless warrior who oft stood stout in the iron shower, when sped from the string a storm of arrows shot o'er the shield wall, the shaft held firm, featly feathered, followed the barb. And now the sage young son of Wetchstan seven chose of the chieftain's thanes, the best he found that band within, and went with these warriors one of eight under hostile roof. In hand one bore a lighted torch and led the way. No lots they cast for keeping the hoard when once the warriors saw it in hall, altogether without a guardian lying there lost and little they mourned when they had hastily hailed it out, dear bought treasure. The dragon they cast, the worm o'er the wall for the wave to take, and surges swallowed that shepherd of gems. Then the woven gold on a wain was laden, countless quite, and the king was born, hoary hero, to Hrone's Ness. 41. Then fashioned for him the folk of Gaiots, firm on the earth a funeral pile, and harness of war and breastplates bright, and the boon he asked, and they laid amid it the mighty chieftain, heroes mourning their master dear. Then on the hill that hugest of balefires the warriors wakened, wood smoke rose, black over blaze, and blent was the roar of flame with weeping, the wind was still till the fire had broken the frame of bones, hot at the heart. In heavy mood their misery moaned they, their master's death, wailing her woe, the widow old, her hair upbound for Beowulf's death, sung in her sorrow, and said full off she dreaded the doleful days to come, death's enow, and doom of battle and shame. The smoke by the sky was devoured, the folk of the wetters fashioned there on the headland a barrow broad and high, by ocean fairers far descried. In ten days' time their toil had raised it, the battle braves beacon. Round brands of the pyre, a wall they built, the worthiest ever that wit could prompt in their wisest men. They placed in the barrow that precious booty, the rounds and the rings they had reft erewhile, hardy heroes from hoard and cave, trusting the ground with treasure of earls, gold in the earth, wherever it lies, useless to men as of yore it was. Then about that barrow the battle keen rode, atheling born, a band of twelve lament to make to mourn their king, chant their dirge and their chieftain honor. They praised his earlship, his acts of prowess worthily witnessed, and well it is that men, their master friend mightily laud, heartily love, when hence he goes from life and the body forlorn away. Thus made their mourning the men of Gaetland, for their heroes passing his hearth companions, quoth that of all the kings of earth, of men he was the mildest and most beloved, to his ken the kindest, keenest for praise. End of Beowulf by Unknown Translated by Francis Barton Gamere